Blank check with Griffin and David. Blank check with Griffin and David. Don't know what to say or to expect. All you need to know is that the name of the show is Blank Check. No, that's fame. Fame has a 15 minute half life. Podcasts last a little longer. <laughs> I mean, that's actually that's. I thought wise. it was pretty apropos. Yeah, that's right? pretty good. I was looking for a Pacino. I mean, he has like fifty good quotes too. He does. You can't go wrong with uh, right. Plumber. But there's a guy in this movie <laughs> who does some really good yelling. Tortious interference. Tortious interference. This is our last Pacino too with man. So getting pissed off. I'm getting curious. If you want to, you know, unless P- Pacino is going to be in like whatever Michael Mann's next movie is. I, I don't know. I don't know. Well, I think, I think Michael Mann's trying to let him sleep. Mm, yeah, he saw insomnia. He's like, I get it. I get it. Sure, sure. You can sleep, pal. You're a pile of garbage. I get it. <laughs> uh, hello, everybody. My name's Griffin Newman. I'm David Sims. This is Blank Check with Griffin and David. It's a podcast about filmographies. Directors who have massive success early on in their career mm. are given a series of blank checks to make whatever crazy passion projects they want. Sometimes those checks clear. Sometimes they bounce. Baby. <laughs> this is a weird check. It's a, it, it, but this is a bouncer. It's a like it's a almost big every bounce. man movie. It's a bouncer. It's a big bounce, and it is kind of inexplicable that they gave him seventy million dollars. I'm sorry. When I say ninety, they, uh, 90? This, the film's budget was ninety million dollars, uh, and the people who gave him that money were Disney, the Walt Disney Corporation, which is insane. It's pretty weird. Yeah, Th- and there are a lot of really interesting quotes from uh, then uh, uh, head of Disney uh, Films, uh, Joe Roth, being like, "I don't know. We tried." It's a really good movie. We're really proud of it. We couldn't force people to go see it. I mean, I, that's under, that's fair. But they kind of threw it's their hands up. It's a good up. movie. But they were like, I don't know why it didn't work. It seems commercial. You don't know why a two hour and 40 <laughs> minute movie yes. behind the scenes of 60 yeah, minutes didn't work? It's like, I'm very surprised. Work. We thought it would work. We're <laughs> yeah. very proud of it. Yeah. I, I love the movie, but yeah. it's not like screaming like right. audiences are going to be paying for this. They'll right. be at the like box office being, no, I can't see it tomorrow. It's going to be tonight. Joe Roth was like talking about it like it was the Iron Giant. <laughs> or, like, I don't know why it didn't connect with audience. <laughs> we had this great product and it, it's a crowd pleaser. It's good for families. We got everyone. Baker Hall, Venora, <laughs> Krause. You know what's the thing I love in this movie? <laughs> Debbie the, Mazar. Here's the thing I love. Go on. And I feel like Michael Mann movies have this, other films have this, but you see it less and less frequently these days. Really long opening credits where almost every actor who has more than two lines <laughs> gets is a, in the a, opening. Oh, their own card, yes, yes, right. right. Or even if it's a split card, by the time you get down to like split cards, it's like, um, like uh, uh, Chief from Carmen Sandiego. <laughs> Rip Torn's in this movie? Yeah. Yeah. I like for like two shots for like yeah. one second, he, right? He gets a single card, single card Cliff opening. Cliff Curtis credit. is in this movie, I think. I think he's he's the, like one of the guys at the beginning, right? I think he is the, the guy, the, the shake or yes, whatever. I think yeah. he's yes, the Cliff shake. Curtis is the shake. Yes, yes, that's yeah. wild. Yes, but single card billing. Yeah, that's what I love. The opening credits for this movie last forty seven minutes. Yeah, well, it's a two hour forty seven minute movie, <laughs> right? <laughs> and they're like, Michael, it could be two hours if you just cut the opening credit. No, I refuse. I can't do it. Um. I didn't realize most of his uh, movies play on TV as Alan Smithy cuts. Uh, sure, because he won't. He just refuses to get it down to three hours or whatever. Right, right. to a three-hour right. block. He famously says, I will add 40 minutes right. so you can put it into a five-hour block. He offered to beef up Ali to make it for it. Was it Heat? Heat. It's Heat. Both, it's heat. I Both. think. Both, yeah. sure, whatever. He was right. the big one where he was like, I don't want to cut a second, but I can add in 40 minutes. Apart from The Keep, what's his shortest movie? Is it Collateral? Collateral Thief. is two hours. Oh, uh, yeah, Thief's pretty short. But, like, apart from... No, Thief's two hours and two minutes. Really? So Collateral has it beat. Wow. Apart from that, like, it, Black Hat... Well, no, Black Hat's no. longer. Yeah. Yeah. Collateral is the one time he made, like, a quote-unquote lean movie. Yes. I think. Yes. Yeah. That's I, interesting. Uh, the guy we're talking about, of course, is Michael Mann. This is a miniseries on his films. It's called Cast of the Podhecans, a.k.a. Michael Mansplaining. Sure. Uh, and the film we're talking about today is The Insider. Mm. The film that, that finally, uh, where, where the Academy finally legitimizes him. He right. finally becomes a, uh, a serious filmmaker after being written off uh, for so many years as a style over substance guy, mm. which is... Insane to think about. It is insane. Insane. Like, ah, no, that hack who made what that 
that cop movie with De Niro or whatever. Yeah, yeah I don't know. Yeah, that dumb I guess I saw that on cable. Two hour and forty minute popcorn film. And then he makes a movie about sixty minutes, and people are like, "Well, sixty. Well, sixty minutes is very important. <laughs> so this movie must be important. We should give it many Oscar nominations." You and I talked about this, but we went to see Detective Pikachu recently. That's true. A That's film that true. feels weirdly inspired by Michael Mann. Sure. There were many scenes where I turned to you and I went, "This looks like Thief." It looks like Thief. It definitely feels inspired by that kind of like and Manhunter. It's got the, the, neon, the neon noir thing. Noir going on. thing. And even yeah. the score sounds like a little tangerine dreamy. Pretty good score. Uh but um We did arrive at the premiere one hour early, so we heard the score on a loop like eighteen times. And they, we were like, This is a good score. They said you had to get there early if you wanted to meet Pikachu. So we got there an hour and a half early. You should introduce our guest. I mean, he's is, allowed to talk on mic. He's allowed That's to talk what on I, mic. I've been yeah. sitting here trying to figure yeah, out. You're no, totally I'm very much to allowed to talk on mic. Okay. Uh, we said we got to get there really early because we're not going to miss a chance to meet Pikachu. Right. Pikachu's going to be in demand. Right. We got there in an hour and a half early. <laughs> they were like, yeah, sure. Here, meet Pikachu. <laughs> Right, it was uh, it was Pikachu, right? It, it wasn't was, like a guy in an inflatable no, costume. No, there was that both was a giant inflatable Pikachu. Right, and a smaller inflatable Pikachu. <laughs> right, both of them were real. We met both of them. We took about 87 pictures. True, true. Got a free Slurpee, and then we went, well, what do we do now? Mm. So then we walked into the theater, and we just sat in the screening room for over an hour. <laughs> Chatting. And that hour was just a still image of Detective Pikachu projected yes. and the score playing. Yeah, and then occasionally a song from the movie would play right, just that, to sort of break up the action. Right, we had our old our old guy grump conversation where we were like, doesn't all music sound the same uh, these days? Yeah, yeah, we were like, Ugh. There's like a Rita or Someone's like, get the detective yeah. or whatever. Gonna detect my heart. <laughs> yeah, I just have never realized how old I am until I, the – trailers for detective pikachu started coming out sure because that's after my time right uh, that movie in general will make you right and i know like i know nothing about pokemon but right. a lot of my friends are younger than me probably because i look mid 20 i got like a mid 20s you look great you look like you're in college i'm yeah. surprised to you're looking this. like a snack yeah, yeah exactly yeah. i thought you were too young uh, for pokemon yeah, yeah no, that's exactly. what you were saying <laughs> <laughs> appreciate that you haven't grown up <laughs> into the, your pokemon phase yet. but no i i just i don't i don't get pokemon at all i don't I barely know who Pikachu is, and oh, he's detective. He's he's well, yeah. but yeah, see, right. I never knew that until the movie came well, out. Well, to be honest, I little. barely <laughs> knew that Pikachu had become a detective, yeah. and I liked Pokemon. It is crazy though to be like, because we saw this movie, and the movie takes uh, no time explaining the rules of Pokemon, and you're like, right, this thing has been around for long enough that they can presume that there is a four quadrant audience that right. needs no table setting. Well, and right. that's and that's what makes me feel old is that everybody talks about this stuff as if well. It's a given. It's, yeah, we it's all like, know. It's like we part of the monoculture. You know the 50 states. Yeah, it's right, literally exactly, that, right. though. It's like, we all, you know, the guy in the boardroom, we all know Pikachu. And there's right. one guy who's like, what's what? a Pikachu? And he's like, get out of and my he's fucking like, office, <laughs> Jerry. <laughs> like, what's an 80s Pikachu esque mascot? Oh. You know? Like a Cabbage Patch Kid or whatever. Or you know Smurfs. What I, mean? I feel like the Smurfs had a similar kind of thing. I guess it's that. But yeah, it's like, I'm trying, like if someone had been like, right, like the Smurfs go to Congress was like right. the first Smurf movie. <laughs> right. That we were like, you know, that we were that deep with the first Smurf movie. Yes. Whereas the first Smurf movie was actually what studios used to do, which is like. They show up in our real yeah, world. They're yeah, they're in the real world right. and they like have to figure out how to buy a Metro card. Right. <laughs> or whatever. It is crazy how often <laughs> they meet like the situation or whoever, whoever sort of, you know, hot that year It is crazy how often studios would spend a ton of money acquiring a big, big property, then hire presumably a screenwriter for millions of dollars to break the story. Right. Who's like never seen the Smurfs. And then they come in, they'd be like, here's my take. There's a portal and they end up in a city. <laughs> <laughs> like everyone kept on selling the exact same movie. And then like a grown man who makes tens of millions of dollars a year is like, yeah, that's that's good. That's, that's a good. Take. Yeah, yeah, let's do this. This right. is a good idea. There was like an interview between um uh, uh Neil Moritz, uh my uh, beloved uh, the Godfather Fast and Furious, Fast and Furious right. franchise and uh the the guy at Paramount who now he just moved his deal over to Paramount. Yeah. Sonic the Hedgehog is the first movie in his deal. And he said, you know, when Neil Ooh. when Neil came to me and said he wanted to make a Sonic movie, I said, I don't get it, not relatable, right. not the kind of thing we're interested in. And then he told me the hook to this movie, and I said, "This is such a compelling, emotional what, that Sonic human finds in. a portal in yes, the yes. real world. Yeah. That was the fucking thing. <laughs> he runs so fast; he's in the real world now." I said, "I don't want to see this movie about a hedgehog," but then he said, "The hedgehog shows up through a portal and meets a human, and he doesn't know how the fucking toothbrush works. It's crazy." Because then you even see like the Paddington movies, and the Paddington movies are like, "Yeah, the bears talk." 
Yeah, right. The Paddington movie at no point is like, it's pretty fucked up that this bear talks. He's actually right. an alien who looks like a bear. They're just <laughs> right. like, he comes from darkest Peru yeah. and he talks and now he's in the city. And... So we're clear though, Paddington 2 is a perfect movie. It's a perfect oh, movie. Oh, yeah, okay. we're okay. all on board yeah. with no, Paddington. Saying, okay. that's... There's no portals. Right, we're right. saying that's the right. bold move is just to be like, if sure. you're making a talking bear movie, just own that it's a talking, it's a talking bear, bear movie. movie. Don't yeah, be right. like, in his galaxy, right. they look like bears. Yeah, right. He drank the serum. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Magically. Yes. Um, and the, all of what we're saying uh, relates a lot to this film, uh, The Insider. Oh, this is, uh, yes. it's like yes. talking about, I, I'm seeing The Insider in my head. Yes. Right, right. Mike Wallace would love to hear all of this. <laughs> right, right. He, if we brought him back, he'd be like, I like where culture's at now. <laughs> yes. And yeah. our, our guest today is something of an insider <gasps> himself. What? He what has a spent segue. time in in the the news trenches. I don't know if they were the trenches. Okay, on on the level ground, they would have been like I could see the trenches. You could see the trenches sure, so, through so my like, night vision goggles. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the great Andy Levy is here. Levy. 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 Yeah. So great. So great. You can't even ever pronounce been my called name. Levy. Oh Eugene my God. Levy. My I get friend. called that a lot. Really? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Fine. Okay, yeah. As long as Eugene, I'm not you know what, Eugene Levy? You're right. I take it back. Yeah. The guy who I famously said was good in every movie. Yes. Until I was reminded of most of the movies that he's in. I, you even, you were so bold I was like, when's he bad? You, you asked it. <laughs> you said, name one time he's So I was like, I don't know, like that fucking Olsen twins movie? And I was like, oh yeah, right. No, oh he, yeah, that's exclusively what he does. Excuse right. me. When he plays Jim's dad that. in like five movies. million movies. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Andy uh, Levy. Andy Levy. I can't believe I messed that up. I knew, I knew that too. That's you the other thing. I knew well, that. Griffin mispronounces everything. I mispronounce Jesus. everything. I mispronounce almost every word. You want to just do it again? You have not mispronounced a single other word this entire time. The, that is this a, episode. That is just a bad excuse. This episode. Wait. Griffin is pretty notorious for mispronouncing. Okay, let me take it again. Our goose this week. <laughs> <laughs> yes, good. The great Andy Levy. Levy. No! Don't do that to oh, me! Oh boy, that will, that will confound him. Now I feel like I fell through a portal. <laughs> we all know Andy Levy. What if he was a detective? <laughs> detective Andy. You were saying, you were saying uh, uh, before we started recording that you're like, you, you've, you've put cable news behind you. And you're trying to figure out what, what the next stage of your life is. Yes. Have you thought about becoming a cartoon detective? I would very much like to be... I, I would like a to, hat. I would like, yeah, a little hat. I, oh, I don't have a hat for you. I, I, I own hats. What do you think? Like, just because I'm not wearing a hat right now doesn't mean I don't own you, you hats. You got great hair, good, clean cut. Thank you. A nice, what kind of product are you using? Uh, I prefer not to say. Okay, because you got a good hold? Sure. Some good hair height, which medium, we all know. Medium stiff, yeah. Yeah, medium stiff. Yeah. Medium stiff, sure. right. Yeah. Right, does it, doesn't look greasy. No. Doesn't look rigid. Nope. But it's got a good yeah. shape yeah, to it. Yeah, it's a matte it. finish. Right. Yeah. But sometimes you got to put a little hat on it if you want to uh -huh, be on the sure. case. <laughs> Going to be on the trail. No, I do. I sometimes I I will sit at home thinking I wish I solved more crimes. Sure, of course. There's so, a lot going out there. Yeah, no, mm -hmm. absolutely. And right. I feel like I've really I've kind of slacked off in the last I think maybe three or four years in, in terms of crime solving. Before that, you were I was doing crime buster on the Pretty case. Pretty good yeah. clip. Right. Yeah. 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 Right. Right. Yeah. 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 I mean, there were fifty sixty a month. Yeah. Right. You put yeah. Them away. There were, look, there were. I'm not saying there weren't days I didn't solve crimes, right. uh -huh. but they. Most days you I, weren't telling anyone. I was though. solving. No, 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 no. You I would, would just sort of like no. What I hear was, about it, I would do like, like this guy did that. Yeah. Kind of like what Sherlock Holmes would sometimes do. He would just dash off a note to the police. Yeah, and right. send it off to Scotland right. Yard. That's sort of what I do. I just I dash off notes to my local God, police. Yeah, I mean, on the Sherlock subject, Holmes is so oh, cool annoying. guy. What, you think what? he's annoying? God, imagine working for the police and then Sherlock hey. Holmes <laughs> writes you a note. Hey, <laughs> he's like, I'm not even going to show up for this one. I just figured it out in my armchair in between opium bouts. David. Yeah. You think he's annoying. I got oh. a counter argument. What? He's a boxer, ain't he? Oh, for sure. The, oh, fucking hell, mate. Yeah, Sherlock Scrapping. That was, that was Guy Ritchie's pitch, right? Is that yeah. he can detect a punch <laughs> like, yeah. it, and then move out of the punch's right. way. Do you know what was incredible? Cause, like, they I feel like England never got mad enough that like a prominent American got to play Sherlock Holmes. And everyone was just like, yeah, whatever. It's you know, kind that's of fine. insane. Yeah. Right. It's kind of wild. Right. Because that movie famously comes out of produced by Robert Downey Jr.'s wife. Right. Susan Downey. Right. They were basically like, let's find a vehicle for Rob. Right? Because right. they yeah. knew like Iron Man was coming, and she right. was like, let's do a victory lap franchise, set it up. So they like announced it and were setting it up before Iron Man, I think. And at the time, they were like, you know, the books are actually really dark, and like Sherlock's like a heroin addict, right? And right, we want right. to go in and do like the messy version of it. And then Iron Man became so huge, and they were like, 
Yeah, no, the heroin stuff isn't in it. It's about, like, boxing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, that's true. Like, it suddenly became, like, no, he's kind of a goof. No, I think the initial concept was, like, it'll be like Batman Begins, he'll be right. young. Right. You know, it'll be, like, you know. But I was going to say, first of all, it was cocaine, not heroin. Oh, you're right. Cocaine. you're right. You're right. Yeah. My you're right. God. You're right. Because it's back when they were, like, put it um, in everything. Yeah. yeah great. Exactly. Just, yeah. yeah. But the he other... does smoke it. He smokes the cocaine. He injects it. Oh, yeah. he, injects he injects it. I knew it was an unusual yeah. way of yeah. doing yeah. cocaine. Yeah, solution. he wasn't. He doesn't like take off his boot and crush it right. on the no. table. Hey, yeah. this is producer Ben. Just wanted to check in. <laughs> yeah. um, no, Andy, what were you going to say? I, I was just going to say that yeah, you, know, you guys are talking about how nobody in England really got mad that mm. we took Sherlock Holmes. They got us back. They took Batman. They did take they Batman. Did. So. They had Batman. They have Superman. They which, have uh, Spider Man. I mean, technically not American. Is why I didn't? But I. But That's sure. a fair point. But sure. he grew up in Kansas. But, He's yeah, Amer- he has a I passport, guess. right? He I has guess. like a yeah, social yeah, security. Yeah, yeah. sure. Oh, does Clark he? Kent does. Does Clark Kent have a social security He's number? Like, did they say like, point. yeah, we had this baby? Um. Yeah. yeah. Where, where's the birth certificate? He might, you can't get is he a home? dreamer? Is Superman? A, is Clark Kent a dreamer? Oh boy. Um. Uh, they two That's sp- all I have to say to that. Oh is boy. oh boy, <laughs> two Spider Men, two Spider Men yeah. from across the pond. Uh, right. Yeah. That's right. I'm just That's happy right. that right now row. this podcast is pure blooded American for American men who Amen. have never lived in England. Amen. I'm just so happy that I know there are no Amen. never lived. Trade. Wait a second. What? Oh, but I lived in England. What? <laughs> <laughs> Swung the microphone right at Andy. <laughs> almost whacked. I'm him. sorry for almost whacking. No, that's okay. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I grew up in England, uh, mm-hmm. which is where I saw this film. Okay. This is the first Michael Mann film I ever saw. Um, uh, interesting. I was 13, and I did not see it because I was like hyped for a Michael Mann movie. Oscar season. I was hyped for it as an Oscar movie. Yeah. Right. And I was a Russell Crowe fan. 13? <laughs> I was a little nerd. <laughs> wow. Um, I was a Russell Crowe fan. I liked him. Mm-hmm. I was sort of like, I had like bought early on Russell Crowe, or uh, you know, whatever he- Stomper? Virtuosity? Well, I could probably saw Romper Snupper later. Definitely saw Virtuosity. We love Virtuosity in this podcast, don't we? Everyone? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, LA Confidential. <laughs> yeah. Right. That was the big one. I'm trying to think what else. I guess that was the big one. I mean, this, right. Cooking the Dead. This was right after LA Confidential. Yes. yes. It's two years later. But I mean, his next film. Pretty this much. This is his yep. big follow up. Yeah. Um, right. And. Yeah, and it was so hyped. It's like, oh, he, he gained weight. He's, you know, playing older. He's got makeup. Ben? Okay, I want to ask Ben. What's up? How old do you think Russell Crowe was during the filming of it's this gonna, movie? It's gonna blow. Um, up. shit. All right, because this. Um, late thirty. Thirty three. Thirty three years Whoa. old. Oh, he's playing fifty five. Holy yep. shit! He gained thirty five pounds. Yes. Yeah, he's thick. But Shaved this his is, hairline. This is the thing. Dyed it gray. Russell Crowe is now fifty five. Right. And he looks exactly like. He kind of does. Yeah. I mean, if anything, he looks kind of good in this. You're kind of like, oh, yeah, this is Russell Crowe with like 10 pounds shaved off. Yeah, that's the incredible No offense thing. to Russell Crowe. At yeah, the no. time, he was like- I, I like right. thick Crowe. Right. I like, uh-huh, you know, sure. sort yeah. of husky dad bod Crowe right. just fine. <laughs> but at the time, he was this very hunky, virile man, and he, it was He's like, a year before Gladiator. Right. Like, you know. It was very yeah, surprising. <laughs> he's looking at some chungus, some big chungus pics. <laughs> yeah. Chunky ben, Crow. Ben, 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 yeah. Well, look, I love, again, I love yeah. him. You love your curvy Crowe. <laughs> But like you know, when Crow now is trying to be slightly more in yes. like action mode, like in Man of Steel or The right. Mummy or whatever, like he's got that sort of like I buttoned this shirt, but if we unbutton it, right, mm, this might take a while <laughs> to sort of re like so like I'm in this I'm in this jacket right and there's now. There's a lot of tension in those buttons. It's sort of like me at a wedding where I'm like I kind of like put the suit on last, like the mm-hmm. day before, and I was like. Hmm, maybe has it been six months since I wore a suit? <laughs> sure. Uh, um, it is, let's, it is just, kind of, let's just do it, guys. It is an incredible thing, though, because he was such, like, a, a conventional sort of, yeah. like, like, you know, sort of top. Square jawed, right. bruiser type. Leading man. Yeah. And, like, they, we were like, oh, man, we haven't had a guy like this in Hollywood in a long time. It was so uh, unusual for him to take this kind of part Very at this moment. And then his career has come full circle back to him. Playing these kinds of guys, essentially seeking these kinds of roles, right? These same kind of broken, sort of like. But he kind of rotated, like because he did a Beautiful Mind, yes, and he's true. But but in between those, he would do his gladiator type. Right. This is his incredible run where it's like he does uh, L.A. Confidential. He's amazing. He was snubbed of an Oscar nomination. Sure. And he gets this as what most people view as the vindication for the lack of L.A. Confidential nom. And it's such a classic Oscar nom because it's a transformation. You're playing a real person. Everything they like. Right. Spacey wins and people were like, Crow should have probably won. 100%. So then the following year when Gladiator comes out, they were like, this is his double makeup. This movie's so big. He's now like a full-on A-list movie star. 
but also he's like kind of been owed two times in a row. And then he does Beautiful Mind, and people are like, fuck, is he going to win twice in two years? It was, I think it was close. Three consecutive Best Actor nominations, yeah. and then he and never gets nominated yeah. again. Which is silly. Yeah. Uh, his movie after that. Andy, do you like Master and Commander? I feel like you would be a Master and Commander I fan. have to admit, and I... I Almost feel like you're going to make me leave. It's fine. I'll be. I okay have never with seen it. it. Never seen wow. it. I think you I would have really to watch like it. it. I know. I think you would dig that movie. Yeah, that's one of my favorite it. movies, uh, and I think he's so good in it. But that's when he's definitely like, I am a husky hunk. I'm a husky right. hunk. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm a big stocky guy. You know, yeah. I'm we're not even going to futz around with me being kind of skinny anymore. Like, no. And then Cinderella Man in 05, So he's right. playing a boxer. Right. Uh, and both know, of those movies still, were like he was getting all the precursors. He was predicted for best actor, and then he, he was left out at the last. He moment. was kind of being taken for granted in those movies, I and they were so. like these sort of bigger supporting stars who were yeah. kind of popping in all right. of them, right? But those are those are solid. Then in two thousand six, Curveball, he reteams with Lily, Ridley Scott, but only to make a movie about drinking wine. <laughs> yes, <laughs> called a good year. Yes, well, where the he year just before, wears glasses and drinks wine. His band Thirty Odd Foot of Brunts, <laughs> sure, sure. Uh, unfortunately dissolved slash evolved. Oh, that's too bad. It Is evolved? that like a conscious uncoupling? We're yeah. dissolving, evolving? <laughs> what did it evolve into? A Raichu? <laughs> hey, you need a thunderstorm for you that. You need one. Um... No, I mean, also he's throwing phones at this, right? This is sort of like classic right. Russell Crowe's dick. Yeah. Right, yeah. he's a drunk. Yeah. He's like constantly punching people. Uh, and I feel like there was that thing, I guess it was right after Gladiator maybe, where there was like a documentary about the are they thirty or forty odd photographs? Thirty. They're only. I, w- 30 I once fucked this up at a trivia game. And, and remember it, when you fucked that bandy's name? Oh, oh my, my god! Right? Please, that was embarrassing. That was one of the worst things I've <laughs> ever done <laughs> in an otherwise spotless life. <laughs> a life of no regrets. We know I'm not someone who stews over everything I've ever said. Ever. You've never expressed any regrets to me at all for anything. You don't even yeah. seem like an anxious person at all. No. no, I'm super chill, super confident. Every word that's come out of my mouth. Um, uh, Harvey Weinstein bought like a documentary about uh, uh, the band um, for like uh, like two three million dollars. Probably just to make Russell happy for something. Right. Else, I mean, right? he was yeah. like, a this guy's such a big star that even his self indulgent rock band documentary will probably do well. And B, I'm so desperate to get in the Russell Crowe business that I'll buy a vanity po- project just in the hopes of getting like. But he's really kind of going like Ridley Scott, like Ron Howard. Sure. Those right, are his guys. Right, right. right. Yeah. He's saying those zones. Right. And then. Uh, I want to do the rest of Crow, actually, because it's fun. Right. Do you want me to then, keep going? Then you get, like, American Gangster. Oh, seven, he's got Three Ten to Yuma and American Gangster, which are both underrated. And he's very like, good in both of them. He's very good in both of them. Yeah, he's great in Three Ten yeah. to Yuma. He's fantastic. He's terrific yeah. in Three Ten yeah. to Yuma. Um, then, but both of them, I mean, I feel like Denzel gets credit, all the credit for American yeah. Gangster. He doesn't. But Crow's great in it. I agree. Yeah. I think he's and three ten. He's fun. He's yeah. That's a fun movie. But that movie kind of kind of doesn't go anywhere. Yeah. And Hollywood's like too old fashioned. Right. You know? But it is funny that in those two movies, he's still basically like a you know leading man, gun toting, right? Yes. And then the next year is Body of Lies, where he is like suddenly like wearing sunglasses, fat behind a right. desk, barking at Leo over the phone. I mean, no one remembers that movie, but like no, that movie pretty. So- that's the that's the flip. That movie's so weird because well, the poster is like DiCaprio Crow and. It's like, this is going to be some espionage thriller. And then the whole movie is like DiCaprio with a gun on the ground and Crow like picking up his kids from school, talking to DiCaprio on Bluetooth. Yeah. Like almost all of his scenes are him on like a Bluetooth headset while he's like, like doing the laundry or something. I had honestly completely forgotten that it's movie a Ridley Scott movie until now. And it's now really I, I remember seeing it. Yeah. Now, but he w- I think it's when Ridley Scott would just was go- going from European financier to financier yes. being yeah. like, Leo, do it. Russell will do it. It'll be like great, eighty right. million dollars. He was kind of doing Tony Scott style movies. He was. Yes. That yes. was very, yes. yeah. very yeah. Tony. Because I movie. actually, in my mind, had that as a Tony Scott. Right. movie. It feels like a slightly Tony higher Scott probably would have yeah. yeah. made it a better body of no lives. question. I love Ridley Scott because I think Body Lies is a little unengaging. Uh, yeah, right. Uh, then he does State of Play, another movie no one remembers that is that totally really watchable. Right. I like, like that movie a fun, a lot. another fun journalism yeah. movie. Right. Yep. Uh, Robin Hood, which I think is great, the Ridley Never Scott Robin it. Hood, where he's that's that's his last time where he's like, no, I'm a you know I'm a leading man, and I'm he, a action boy. I remember him in interviews saying, I think superheroes are stupid. I'm oh, embarrassed that my son likes superheroes. I want to make an action movie to make a real hero that boys should respect. He does shoot a cool arrow. He in shoots that a cool arrow. No, I, I'm sorry, I know I'm older than you guys, but the only true Robin Hood is Kevin Costner. He, uh, we, we love him. Excuse me. Uh, we stand yeah. a sexy fox on the yeah. show. No, I know. 
Oh, well, sure. That's I know, true. Stan a sexy I know. cartoon fox. That's true. I know. I know. Who else has played Robin Hood? Well, Taron Edgerton, but that was terrible. Uh, Carrie Always. Right, right, right. And then, like, Les Mis, well, Man well, of I, Steel. Les Mis is a notoriously Ooh. disastrous performance. I mean, he's terrible in that. Noah, he just seems uncomfortable in Les Mis. I am singing in Les Mis. He seems really, like, off his game. You yes. know what I mean? He looks, like, nervous through the whole movie. In Les Mis? Yeah, in Les Man Mis. Man of Steel, I think he's fun, actually. I love him in Man of Steel. I, I love the first... 30 minutes yeah, of Man of Steel. his part of Man of Steel is what I'm into. I yeah. want more like Kryptonian, you know, intrigue and like bug flying. I rewatch just the Russell Crowe bug flying portion of that movie a <laughs> yeah. lot. With all the, with the weird computer that looks like that toy yes. with the, the, the metal yes. spikes. Yes. We never know what the name of that toy is. Yeah. Once Once again, does it have a name? The best thing in Man of Steel, Kevin Costner. Oh, I, I mean, I do think he that's is a good very, in that. You're, so you're just like I, Kevin Costner, Costner is an shows American up. Icon. You're like yeah. he's right. an American you're icon. Your fist. I will. What's yes. your favorite Costner? <laughs> oh. <laughs> are you a, are you a postman? I'm not. I'm not a postman. I'm not yeah, a postman. Yeah, he mailed that. No, no. <laughs> no. I gotta take uh, the draft. No not. way out might be oh, great. I mean, okay. it's definitely okay. up there for me. Yeah, I'm trying to think what my favorite Costner is. But I love like I liked him in Jack Ryan. Shadow Recruit? He's pretty good in that like, movie. Like, he's just fun to I watch mean, that in movie that movie. I mean, movie is all mentor. You know, yeah, it's Jack exactly. Ryan that's the well, yeah. problem. Oh, and like, then the same in the, the one with uh, yeah, he's Molly's a Game. He's Molly's incredible game. in Yeah. yeah. He is yeah. good in that. That, was, that scene is wild, but he's good in no it. Sense. I was trying to think of the Coast Guard movie with... Uh, oh, the oh, re- uh, perfect... Not the Recruit. No, no, the Ashton Kutcher one. Yeah, with It's not called The Protector. It's not called The Defender. I know what you're talking about. The Guardian? The Guardian. The Guardian, yeah. Thank yeah. you. I didn't have. I didn't look that yeah. up. I will watch nice. that movie anytime it comes really? out. Really late night. Yeah. Is that and that's uh, Mr. Uh, Fugitive, right? Uh, Davis, Andrew I, Davis. I think Andrew that's Davis. Andrew oh, Davis. Really? That sounds Andrew right. Davis directed yeah. that. I think he did. Oh, I don't even know that. Yeah. I know uh, that's one of those dependable sort of like old a, oak it, thriller directors. Yeah. yeah. Field Dreams is my favorite costume. Yeah. Um, uh, and but Bull Durham. A Tin Cup is also. Yes. Hey, you know what the villain's name is what? in Tin Cup? Played by Don Johnson. It's uh, oh, David Sims. David Sims. Yeah. Is it really? That's yeah. right. With two M's. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you guys know the crazy thing about the Russell Crowe, Ridley Scott, Robin Hood, right? Uh, hit me. Like hottest. I think we've talked about this. But script hit me. in Hollywood. Hit me. Ben just hit David. Ben's got a little Tintin shirt on right now. I he love looks it. very Tintin. He's got he the full flip going on the top of the head. Right. Um. It. Uh. Hottest spec script in Hollywood. What if Robin Hood was the bad guy and Sheriff of Nottingham was the good guy? And it was a PR issue. Yeah, it was called <laughs> Nottingham. Right. Uh, of yes. Course it was. Right. And it was supposed to be set from the perspective of Nottingham. Right. And Ridley Scott signs on to direct. Universal buys it for millions and millions of dollars. Right. Russell Crowe signs on to play the sheriff in Nottingham. And then over the course of working on the movie, developing the script, Russell Crowe starts going like, man, I'd really like to play Robin Hood. <laughs> so then they go like, what if it's a draft where Robin Hood and Sheriff Nottingham are the same guy? He's his own worst enemy. And then it just wow. becomes, what if it's just Russell Crowe plays Robin Hood? I think someone just told him, like, did you know Russell Crowe, I mean, Robin Hood was a crusader? Yeah. And Robin, yeah, Ridley was like, yeah, that's cool. But they spent, like, three, four million dollars on a script that then they we, used We've definitely none talked of. about this. Yeah. Well, I wrote that script and I'm a millionaire. Yeah, so, you well, are. You know, whatever. I mean, now, of course, he's playing Roger Ailes. Yeah, which is another one where he's like, uh it was a tough job, but I had to gain 80 pounds yeah. in a month. Yeah. Right. Like he says as he like eats spaghetti. Well, I think like, he said that for the insider, I, I think I read that he he basically said he ate cheeseburgers. Like that's, yes. that's the, what he ate with The poor man. Yeah. And it's, it's like, this is, you want, a, a, you want a reward for that? <laughs> Fine. Here's a cheeseburger. There's your reward. I remember hearing like, I've heard like disgusting things. Like Jared Leto, uh, the Joker himself, mm-hmm. so played uh, Mark David Chapman in that movie that like barely anyone remembers. Gave the, himself gout. Uh, gave himself gout. The the John Lennon assassin movie. What's it called? Chapter. Would, yeah. Yeah. Chapter twenty seven. I think. Yeah. And he would eat ice cream with olive oil. Oh. Like, and when I heard that, like all the time, when I heard that, I was like, it's just there's no way that's worth it. Uh, excuse me, my friend. Uh, the details are even grosser than that. Oh, I remember sure. this because at this point in time, I was desperately trying to gain weight. Because I was a very, very right. You weren't boy. trying to play Mark David Chapman. You literally were just trying, trying to uh, look you know, alive. Stop scaring your doctors. <laughs> right, right, right. I was a spooky, scary dancing skeleton boy. Um, he would buy pen- pints of Ben and Jerry's, pour olive oil in it, and then microwave it so that he could just drink it. Oh, oh my god, that's vile. Because I tried it once. And how was it? I did it without the olive oil, but the microwaving ice cream. It was awful. What do you talk? Why would anyone drink ice cream? I don't. I mean, isn't that what milkshakes are? This is literally just like 
<laughs> thick milk, though. You know? Isn't that what a milkshake is? <laughs> Terrible. Get out of here. Eat a turd. All right, sorry. <laughs> the Insider. He, yes. um, the, the, I looked through the IMDb. The one other time he tried to go back to classic Russell Crowe was Noah. Sure. I mean, he's a beefy Noah. He's beefy. But that was the last time he played, like, He needs of... to be beefy. He's got to get logs and, right. you know, but Dr. make an arc. Dr. Jekyll. <sighs> oh. Where he tells... Oh. Tells Tom Cruise that Tom Cruise is younger than him when, oh. in yes. fact, Tom Cruise is older than Russell Crowe. Yes, Winter's Tale, where he plays like a real like. Mm, I've never seen Winter's Stocky Tale. gangster. I really need to. Now yeah. I'm just sad about the Dark Universe again. Oh God, you're sad about it? Well, that it's gone. Oh, you never know. It could and come back. That's what monsters like to do: <laughs> make you think they are gone. The Dark Universe will rise. Yeah. What if the second Dark Universe film is about the resurrection of the Dark, dark universe? universe? Right. Like Sophia Butella's like in an office and someone's like, We got a sequel and she's like, No, they canceled those movies and like it's it turns out it's like Jake Johnson and he's like, No, we can re- we can we just need to go to the tomb. I want like a dark universe twist movie where like Universal is like, here's our big prestige play of the year. It's a biopic about like uh, Marie Curie. Sure. And then right. halfway through the movie, the dark universe <laughs> dun, 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 the globe turns. <laughs> Just when you thought it was safe. Marie Curie, if she fell into the Black Lagoon. <laughs> uh, and then Pacino, we've talked about this era of Pacino a lot. This is such an underrated Pacino so, performance. So Fucking underrated. Goodness. Because I think this is seen as one of his yelling performances right. from that sort of devil's advocate He time. only yeah. gets there in the last 30 minutes. Yes. And when he and does, even then, he's it's frustrated. Fine. Yes, yes, it's fine. One hundred percent. He's yeah. in the zone. He's very good at being kind of uh, just a stressed out producer guy. The first you know? two hours, it's classic, understated, yeah. super I mean, quiet. His hair is this like beautiful hair piece. Yes. It's a beautiful nineties hair piece. It should have won fantastic. a Nobel Prize yeah. in like chemistry or yeah. something. See, I I believe he's one of those guys who is using like sectional pieces. Oh, really? like right? It's like. <laughs> It's like the Sistine Chapel, like right. sort of. Because I think if it's it was like scaffolding purely, for his hair, if it was purely a piece, they wouldn't design it like that. I think the the you end up at this hairstyle because he's like, I have these couple of long strands. Yeah, can we push right. them as far up as possible? Yeah, can we build volume around that? Right, but it's right, weird because right. this movie is considered like a Russell Crowe's movie. Yes. Pacino's role, A, Pacino's role, he is the star yes. of yeah. this movie. I, right. I mean, he is, yes, he is the lead actor in this movie. 100%. Like, it's right. not even close. No. And he's so fucking good. Like, I yes. I hadn't seen this movie. I watched it, you know, since it came out in the theater. And then I watched it again. Me too, basically. I, yeah. In my head, this was, I remembered Russell Crowe. Mm-hmm. I, I did not remember how amazing Pacino was. Me neither. Well, I like thought of it deal. because Crowe got the nomination. The it's yeah. like, oh, Crowe right. just dominates yeah. He's so incredible. You've right. never seen it. And Pacino is going like, oh, what the hell do you mean? Yeah. I missed a 60 minutes. Yes, got a great know. ass. <laughs> right. My program has a, Mike Wallace has got a great ass. Yeah. <laughs> and my head's all the way up. <laughs> right, we were talking about like heat is him like kind of losing his mind, but it still works. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I love yeah. it. But like the fact that he could still go back to being like this fucking present and non showy in, in a scene. between these, he made Devil's Advocate, right? right? And Devil's Advocate is what I think the public is like, that's it. Pacino can't be subtle anymore. Right. It's over. But right? then he has this and he has insomnia. I know. Both right. of which he rules in, and then he's fully broken forever. By the way, he's fantastic in Devil's Advocate. Oh, and agreed. I'm, oh, yeah. I mean, I mean it's that movie what is... the movie wants from yeah, him. Yeah, exactly. It's not right. It's not like everyone else in the movie is like, no, right. this is a subtle tale of if <laughs> you mean, worked for C. Keanu Reeves is <laughs> Doing some mid southern North Pacific. That's one accent. of his. Yeah, where like who and, asked him to try that accent? Yeah. I don't know. There are some incredible deep southern accents from British Irish character actors in this movie. Michael yeah. Gambon's accent work is amazing. Uh, I love Michael Gambon playing a southerner. Yeah. He loves yeah. to do it. So good. Toys, he plays a yes. southerner. He played Lyndon Johnson in like a TV uh, series Dumbledore, or something. Dumbledore, of course, is from Kentucky, of canonically. <laughs> now, Harry Potter, you know. <laughs> yeah. You you didn't put your name in this goblet. You didn't read J.K. Rowling I do declare. That? Yeah, yeah, right. Right. Exactly. Yeah. I always thought of Dumbledore as a southern gentleman. <laughs> he likes mint juleps. Yeah. <laughs> He's always sitting on the porch <laughs> drinking a mint julep. This Voldemort fella... I do declare. All right, I I do declare I, I'm just going to say I no do declare man. over and over. It's just Foghorn yeah. Leghorn. Yeah. That's all I can yeah. do. Uh, Comfor. Comfior. 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 How do you say his name? I don't know how you say his great, name. Great but... Southern accent yep. in this. Sure. Yep. Uh, not a good Southern accent. Diana Vreeland. 
Uh, right. The weakest element of this movie. Not her performance, the entire treatment of her character by all parties. I mean, Diane. You mean Diane Vernoa. Vernoa. Yes. What, what, what am you I saying? You said Vreeland. Jesus Christ. Are you okay? I'm not sleeping well. What's in that water? Is it, is it dum-dum juice? <laughs> dum-dum juice. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it's just, uh, you're not sleeping well? I'm not sleeping well. Wasn't well, why not? I got, I got that insomnia. I got that Pacino disease. You were doing Pacino bits. I was doing Pacino bits all night. <laughs> all the actual right. answer is I was doing Pacino bits all night. Uh, but you're absolutely right. I wasn't going to sleep because I kept on saying to my girlfriend, let me sleep. <laughs> that is not a joke. I was until like three o'clock in the morning. Um, let me sleep. Venora, who's obviously great in heat, yes. is sadly yeah, pretty underserved. In I this think this uh, character uh, sucks. Oh, horrible. Yeah. Too. Horrible. 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 I mean, horrible. I, I guess that must be part of the real stories that they got divorced, but um but, don't have it be that she's like, I'm divorcing you because you're a whistleblower. Yes. Like, which is sort of what the movie lays out. But it's it's not all that dissimilar from her character in Heat, although it must have no. been weird for Pacino to be working with, like, she's your ex, but she's with yes. the other guy in the movie. Yes. Like, that must have been just awkward. Really strange. Working with your ex is just yes. never fun. <laughs> never fun. Right. Um, but, but not all that dissimilar. And, like, I feel like in both movies she's, like, married she can't understand that a a, a man's got a job to do yes this which is, is a the right, michael man problem is, uh, a yeah, real absolutely. michael man hang right. up it's yeah. like he writes these incredibly nuanced detailed male characters yep. that are people making incredibly complicated decisions within a system right. who are never clearly good or bad right. or always a mix of the two and then the women are defined by how, how supportive the or overcooked. unsupportive right. they yes. are. Yeah. right so it's either pacino's wife in this is great but has very little screen time because she's just like you're good right and uh, and and Dana Venora is in this a lot, very poorly, to just stand there and go like, yeah. I don't understand, like you're doing this to me. Yeah, and all the I mean, Gina Gershon's character, it's terrible. It just it's like just... Debbie Mazer, like there's that scene where they're all explaining the legalities of, it, and everyone else knows exactly what she's they're talking about, yeah, and she just butts in to be like, I'm sorry, do I not understand? Like, yeah. explain this to me. Like all the women in this movie yeah. are it was... bad. Yep. Unbelievably noted. And that is like Michael Mann's big Achilles heel as a director. I think his best female character ever is uh, Viola Davis in Black Hat. Uh, I love that character. Like, th that's the one time he wrote a female character that like uh, was not defined by being a woman. Mm -hmm. Right. You know? Um, by her, uh, her duties as a homemaker uh, or, or lack of interest in that role that she should be loving. But but yes, that's the weakest element of this movie. Yeah. Her accent is very Foghorn Leghorn. -y. Her accent is not great. I, I get he loves to trade, you know, to sort of keep an actor for a couple of movies. You know what yes. I mean? And like, so he's retaining Al and Diane from Heat. Mm -hmm. Is he retaining anyone else from Heat? Mm -hmm. I don't think so. Supporting cast Val Kilmer is who he wanted to play uh, Wygan. I could see that. Yeah. I could see. What I if don't Val know. Kilmer I can't, I can't see Val Kilmer putting on weight like that. I know. <laughs> Val would never do it. He's looking no. great these days, yeah, yeah. right? Uh, He's a... Poor, poor Val. Yeah. Opposite um, direction. Opposite uh, direction. Yeah, I guess that's it. I imagine if Val had done this and gotten an Oscar nomination. I know. Oh, that would have been, been nice. so strange. Yeah. But I don't think he was ever going to do it as well as, as Craig did. I, maybe no, no. in the world where Steve Rogers went back. <laughs> in the alternate maybe Val Kilmer won an Oscar yes. what if that's this movie that's the only difference what a Marvel movie is that's about that's the only right. difference where it's like uh, Captain Marvel goes to see a movie and it's Val Kilmer and the Insider ding dong oh ding dong. I wasn't sure okay let's open the door Cree. Jesus Christ hello people told me you were hot David 2019 you're so fucking ugly Wow. Yeah, this is hot. really coming in hot. I'm oh. a straight talker. I'm Michael Mann. Hey, Michael Mann. How are you doing? Doing all right, Dub Bears. <laughs> Son of a Chicago grocer, I'm Yeah, told. my dad was a grocer, the bull. <laughs> uh, filmmaker of some renown. We just talked about your movies. Uh, yeah, currently uh, talking uh, about look, The Insider. Uh, I mean, uh, renowned uh, filmmaker. Uh, run my own publishing uh, imprint now, and also I'm an incredible manscaper. They call me Michael Manscaping. Amazing that I didn't put that together. Of course. You're a great manscaper. Now, you got to trim your bush. It makes your privates look bigger. Oh, so for you, it's just it's just a matter of accentuation. I'm just giving you one example. Oh, okay. okay Don't be enough. stupid, okay? Come on. Now, when you say I'm Dumbles. ugly, are you... <laughs> what was that? I oh, devils. Right, 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 right. Keep up. What, are you dumb too? <laughs> it's like being hit on all sides. That's how I get good performances out of people. You can't keep up. Yeah, right. Oh, wait. I get it. You're bad at podcasting, huh? <sighs> He's nailing me. 
I see. I'm incentivizing him to work hard. Well, Michael. Yeah. Support for Blank Check comes from Manscaped, mm. the number one in men's below the belt grooming. Yeah, sounds they, like me. They offer precision engineered tools for your family jewels. Yeah, talking about a nutsack. Uh, that's that's what I'm talking about. Talking about a pair of testes and a scrotum. <laughs> now, Ben. Yeah. You ever, you know, been shaving down there? Maybe I nick your balls. I did. <laughs> well, sorry, I... to take the words out of your mouth. I was gonna say one time I nicked my balls real bad. They kept bleeding. No, I, I just wanted to point out, uh, no, you're not talking about Nick the Balls, who is, of course, a famous Chicago gangster of your youth. Nick no, the, no, Nick no. The balls. Uh, big, uh, big idol of mine. One could say maybe it was an unconscious homage that I nicked my own balls. <laughs> to Nick the Balls. In reference to Nick the Balls. No, I was just going to say I uh, cut my uh, scrotum. Uh, ben, what, I'm sorry to cut you off. Michael, man, it's quite all right. I've used this product before. Oh, I, wow. I purchased it before they even became a sponsor, and I've used it, and I'm going to tell you right now, it's smooth. It doesn't nick you. They got, a like, a plastic guard on it. Yeah. And uh, I, I'm rocking and rolling down there. I yeah, I mean, you. look, they, they redesigned the electric trimmer, okay? Their lawnmower 2.0 has skin-safe technology, so this trimmer won't nick or uh, snag your nuts. The tigers. Now, listen. <laughs> That's Detroit. <laughs> uh, what's I? I'm <laughs> limited to one city? Fair enough. Please, I got versatility. I got range. I got pressure. You got pressure. Okay, now listen got. to me. I'll here's, you. here's a real piece of advice, okay? Mm -hmm. You don't use the same trimmer on your face as you're using on your balls. Uh... Unless you want to turn out looking like Dennis Farina. <laughs> How do you think you got those pock marks? Mm, that's, that was the mistake he was making. If you thought his face looked bad. Downstairs? His nuts looked worse. Not so good? The Yankees. But they had a lot of character. <laughs> They had a lot of character, right? Like those balls. Oh, his balls had a ton of character. They told a story. To Most look at definitely. Them. They had experience. They had city miles on them. <laughs> Listen, okay, Manscaped also has the Crop Preserver. It's an anti-chafing ball deodorant moisturizer. You ought to put deodorant on your armpits, right? Yeah, I do. I said right? Yes. Yes, sir. Okay, why are you not putting deodorant on the smelliest part of your body? That's true. I, Mans uh, Manscaped sent over a whole kit. Smell terrible. Deodorant. I'm sure I'm working on Smell it. Smell terrible. Okay, look. Look, Michael. You've been you've been you've been giving it to me good. But admit, this is probably one of the better ad reads you've ever done. I, it's true. It's professional. I awaken it's, something in you. It's magnetic, right? Yeah, but, a personal um, endorsement for me. Right, right, right. Yeah, Haas, so Haas is on good. board. But Dude, let, you never get that. Well let me tell yeah, you no, something. You, never get that. you, you wanna tell Michael Mann something? Shoot. Blank check listeners can get twenty percent off and free shipping with the code check at manscaped.com. Your balls will thank you. Uh, boy, I gotta take out my checkbook, take out a fountain pen, write a check to Manscaped. No, you just gotta use the code check at manscaped.com. That is, get 20% off, free shipping, and a free travel bag with the code check at manscaped.com. That is 20% off with free shipping and a free travel bag. Manscaped.com and use the code check. Can I just say something quickly? Sure. As a director. Okay. That's your job? It is very, very refreshing. To do an ad read where they have specifically directed you to talk about testicles. <laughs> Rather than you just slipping it in. Being around the bush, so to speak. Sure. The man bush. I believe you. Okay. Smell you later. Double. Also, like, and I had forgotten this because all I sort of remembered was that it was kind of talky. Yeah. It's super tense. Oh, yeah. Like, I went through, I think, an entire jewel pod <laughs> while watching this nicotine movie Vape and, Andy. and part yeah. of it is because they won't shut up about cigarettes that's true the whole time they're like the nicotine it's so but, sweet and, and delicious like, yes, uh, through and it, ammonia and it we get your, to your brain it hits your system it's like oh fuck off andy i uh, i'm like they're saying like ammonium or yeah. whatever and i'm yeah. like oh i want a fucking cigarette salivating god but it's it's really and a lot of it is i think i think uh, ben and i were sort of talking about this uh when we were on time the it, it's, it's the way it's the well way played, he shoots well it is, even though it's a lot of scenes of people talking, yeah, it's just he finds a way to shoot it with with the the handheld camera and and the angles and the you know tracking shots. Following, there's the scene early in the movie where Russell Crowe is just well, I think when he's leaving, yeah, Brandon Williamson, and the camera is like right next to his head, yes, and it's not something you see in a lot of movies. It just makes it like it's just a guy leaving a building, but you're like. Shit, I can't stop watching this because right. it's so interesting. I think a lot of people crib from this movie and then it becomes the sort of like overdone shooting an office movie like it's a thriller, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Like, I mean, P Paul Greengrass is pulling from this a lot. 
You know, there are a lot of people like that who are sure. pulling from this all of this movie and adding sure. things to it and evolving it. But this feels like a sort of key origin point of, you know, what if you shoot movies about like moral conundrums yeah. and like business and journalism like it's an action movie, uh, uh, you know, like it's a, a real like edge of your seat uh, thriller. Um, which also, I mean, the movie is so much about the paranoia of like, uh, you know, this guy's life is ruined because either he's being followed all the time or he's always going to think that someone's exactly. following right. It's him. sort of yeah. the classic ending of the Sopranos conundrum where it's like, even right. if Tony isn't dead. The one where Tony gets killed? Yeah, right. yeah, where he gets killed and his brains go everywhere. No, but it's yeah. like, even if he isn't dead, he'll always be looking over his shoulder assuming he's about to die, right? Like, that's right. sort of the, the the ambiguous reading of the ending right, of the Right, that the flaming car. Spoilers for the ending of the Sopranos. Yeah. <laughs> When Russell Crowe drives by the flaming car and he like right. looks at it for a while, my girlfriend right. was like, "What? Uh, what? What is that supposed to be?" And it's like, it's just now everything looks threatening to him. Right, but also Michael Mann loves to shoot uh, a, a flaming, comp- flaming car. Well, yeah. right, but also yeah. like a and complex man yes. <laughs> looking at something inanimate or something like unusual, right. like with a furrowed brow yes. and then moving on. Yes, <laughs> well, yeah, one of his favorite that. things. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> um, okay, so yeah, you're right. Uh, he wanted, I guess, this. Oh, that's interesting. Man had read The mm-hmm. Good Shepherd. Eric yes. Roth had this script about like the, the birth of the CIA. Right. That De Niro, of course, eventually turns into an excellent movie that no one talks about. But it was one of the great unmade scripts in Hollywood. Right. And like, so Man reads that, and he's yeah. like, you're cool. Was you... that with Matt Damon, too? Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah, I remember Matty that. Matty Damon. We got uh, Jolie. Yeah. yeah. Who else is in that? Well, De Niro. De Niro. Pesci. Pesci. He he's got, good like, in that. Everybody in that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, good movie. Never seen and it. And so, really? Yeah. I mean, like the, it's, you know. It's based on a book, though, right? Because I, yeah, re- I had read the book. it's based on a book by the, the guy book. who, it, you know, Damon is playing. One of the. Right. I can look up. Yeah, he said it was going to be a trilogy. De Niro was going to make three of them. All in on that. Yeah. That sounds great. Yeah, De Niro, please do that. Did I tell you the Tribeca story? <laughs> you did. Can I tell, should I tell <laughs> yes, it on mic? Please, please. Now, I don't know if you guys know this, but uh, Robert De Niro doesn't like Donald Trump. Yeah, this is top Can you secret. Say that yeah, no, he thinks that Donald Trump is a, a clown. A clown. This guy is a chump. But he you're thinks. clear to say this publicly. Mm, is he well, on the record with it? Well, here's what I want to tell it's you. A rumor. I, I mean, was at the. It's one of those oh, okay. sort of like Ricky yeah. Gervais. It's almost like it's kind of like an insider. <laughs> it's like yeah. Gervais like everyone knows. Yes. Yes. It's yeah. like everyone. Yeah, but it's an We're unspoken. Like, you don't yeah. say it, right. Right. and right. certainly right. they never say it. No, I mean they. He has dinner with Trump every week, and Trump has no idea. Trump has no idea. But no, this is his best friend. Right. And he's the best friend. Yeah, he was best man is all three of his weddings. <laughs> no, so uh, it's the closing night of Tribeca, uh, which of course is De Niro's baby. And so De Niro is there introducing the film yesterday, Danny Boyle's new film. And he comes out and he's like, oh, "When Danny, when I heard this is about a world with oh, and no one knows what the Beatles are, I was like, how sad." And everyone's like, hey. and "Right, right." Yeah. And he's like, "Then I thought." A good idea for a movie would be a world where no one knows who Donald Trump is. And, I mean, he they forged a crown for him. The oh audience is just like, God. yes! <laughs> he did it! <laughs> oh Trump immediately, like, turned into ash, I think. Oh. He thanos you know? Himself. <laughs> he just puffed away. Trump snapped himself. <laughs> uh, you know, we all had b- bells that we started ringing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly like that. Uh, it was great. Do you remember- I, the movie started three hours late because of the riot <laughs> right. Well, it became a parade, too, right? Yeah, it became a parade. Right. Right. They had to immediately and file. People kept turning to each other being like, that would be a good movie. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, Feel good comedy this summer. So funny. I just, I truly enjoy De Niro <laughs> as like kind of like the grandpa from Thanksgiving who's just like, I want to say something. I think Donald Trump's terrible. And everyone's like, All right, wow, geez, Grandpa. I love it. I love it. Uh, my favorite uh, <laughs> totally misplaced uh, uh, Trump uh, Twitter beef was uh, after the, the De Niro fuck Trump thing when he just said like. Oh, uh, the Tonys. right? Yeah. yeah. Bob, Bob De Niro, overrated actor, clearly lost his mind. Uh, shouldn't have done so many boxing movies. The implication being this guy got yeah, he punched got in the his head. His right. brain sort of <laughs> smushed up. He did two. Uh-huh. Count them two boxing films. Right. And one of them was that one that no one remembers. Grudge Match. Grudge Match, right. Right, right. And it's those like... films are 30 years apart. Right. That same week, he invited Sylvester Stallone over to the White House and was photographed <laughs> shaking hands with him in the Oval Office. Great man, an underrated actor. Right. If you're going to criticize one guy for doing too many boxing movies. That's true. Well, also, a guy who kind of talks like he's been <laughs> yeah. punching the head a lot. His you implication know? <laughs> was... 
<laughs> yeah, wait, you think that Donald well, Trump didn't I, I think his insult through? I mean, now I, I don't like Trump anymore after I, hearing I this. I know, I yeah. know. Griffin has built such a logical case yeah. in, in the, yeah. here right. yeah. that now you just know. Because like, right. his, his logic was Oh, I'm time. hearing uh, the House is right. starting impeachment proceedings. They, yeah. uh, they heard about this. Right. They were like, you're right. Sylvester Stallone's done way more boxing movies. Like, let's do it. Let's like, Let's it make this Robert De Niro world a reality. <laughs> yeah. Right. We got it. We got it. They're going to build a, a memory gas that will to spread across the land on the phone. Okay, look. He had read the Good Shepherd, yes, which is what led us on this tangent. <laughs> and he had read the article, the Vanity Fair article. He had read, and so they they get together. They, I'm pretty sure they. Like, it was an met article about the making of a story. Uh, and yes. Then they decide to write a story about the article about the making of the story. Uh, and then the producer Peter uh, Jean Bruges mm -hmm. uh, told. Uh, Michael Mann watch LA Confidential. Uh huh. Michael Mann thinks it's great. He flies to Mystery Alaska. But he says this guy's too young. This guy's a great actor. I don't know if he can do it. Crow wants it. He studies the tape of, right. of the of, interview. Of the real Wigand, right? Yes. Um, so he goes to set Mystery Alaska, a movie on... that doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. It's kind of a cute movie. I like it actually. Cute. Yeah, but it doesn't exist. No, people don't. Remember We're that the first one. people to speak of that movie in twenty years. That well, it's true. a mystery. Um. Crow gained 35 pounds. He shaved his head back. That, the thing, uh, though, is that when Michael Mann shows up at the Mystery Alaska set, Crow has perfectly emulated the 60 Minutes interview. Right, right. And he said, like, this guy has nailed it so hard that I, I can't deny it. So uh, then it becomes the you have to figure out a way to make yourself look 20 years older. And then Pacino is always in place, and he's the one who's like, you should cast Christopher Plummer, who is kind of the MVP of the movie. It's it, amazing. Yeah. It's one of the greatest performances I in my... It, I love this performance so much. Yeah. And it not being nominated for an Oscar is one of the most yeah, bizarre, bizarre snubs because it's so in their lane. But you know what it is? Yeah. He didn't wear makeup to look like Mike Wallace. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. I... I when I was a kid, I thought that Mike Wallace was in this movie as yeah, himself. No, absolutely. Right. Like, I think walking out of the theater, I was like, Mike Wallace is kind of hard on himself. And my yeah. mom was like, that wasn't... That was Christopher Plummer. Yeah. I'm going to tell you the supporting actor nominees. I'm so I'm still mad about 2000. It. Can yeah. I guess? Yeah. Okay. Well, you know, 99, but yeah, the 2000. Right. The 2000. The okay. Tom Cruise. Yeah. Uh, Michael, it's a good. It's a good one. Michael Caine. Yeah. Hilly Joel Osment. Correct. Uh, Michael Clark Duncan. Right. Yeah. And then the fifth one is bad. You're no, giving it's me great. a knowing look. Well, Kane is the is kind of the weak link. The fifth one is as great. cute as he is in that movie. Jeff Ridges in the Contender. No, that's, that's 2000. a year later. Right. Okay. It's like a star-making supporting turn. Oh, Jude Law in The Talented Mr. Rip. Right. Oh, yeah, okay. He's incredible. Of that. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really good yeah. category. It is. Yeah. The Wrong Man won. The Wrong Man yeah. won and was nominated. Yeah. Like, Plummer should just slide right into that, that spot. That was like the story yeah. of that whole year. Michael Caine yes. <laughs> had an Oscar. Yeah. Like, Plummer had never been nominated. You know, he's a legend. Yeah. He's, you know, a legend Mr. Wayne. Yeah. Right? He's been around forever. He's playing Mike Wallace. He's doing it perfectly. They were like, this guy's probably going to be dead in four years. We're never going to get a chance to nominate him three more times and give him <laughs> one win. He, he just doesn't work a lot. He's never going to replace yeah. the this year's best actor winner in a movie <laughs> 20 years from now as John Paul Getty. He has three nominations and one win exclusively between the ages of 80 and 90. Yes, exclusively in his 80s. Yes, it's crazy. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, but he I should have had four nominations. The other thing that I think work, worked against uh, Christopher Plummer in this film is that Mike Wallace. This was your take. I think you're ran right. a pretty aggressive campaign yeah. against yeah. it, and in a very, very meta narrative, his complaint was he didn't like that the movie made it look like he took too long to, to go, take the right side. But that's what happened, I think. Right. But the way that Christopher Plummer, in what should be his Oscar scene, mm. explains that at the end of a life. What matters to you most is the last thing that people remember. Right. Mike Wallace was so terrified yeah. of this narrative within the movie right. superseding the narrative of when he did finally step up to the plate. Right. That then he like, yeah. and I think he's a connected man, you know. Yeah. And he was mad about the line uh, uh, that Christopher Plummer says in the movie about not wanting to spend the rest of his days in the wasteland of NPR. Yeah. Yes. Because yeah. uh, I remember Mike Wallace saying, he's like, I would radio. never say anything yes. like that. It is uh, quite it's a pointed line. It's any, a great line. I will it's say, probably made up. If I was an Oscar line. voter and uh, the real Mike Wallace yelled at me, I probably would do whatever Back he says too. The fuck down. This movie is about how if Mike Wallace <laughs> is yelling at you, it's scary. Yes, <laughs> you don't want him to do that. Uh, absolutely. This not. This movie opens with Mike Wallace yelling at a sheik, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, who is disputing where he's going to sit. 
right? Man, you know, it, uh, I, no good. I got the heart running. Well, that's okay. I want to talk about that scene because that scene to me. So we're we're, we're at the beginning. This yeah. is good. You're yeah. at the beginning of the movie. Yeah. And and uh, Al Pacino's character, Lowell, Ber- Lowell Bergman. Uh, yes. Lowell Bergman. Yes. Has has arranged this interview with the sheikh who's uh, uh, has in Hezbollah. Mm-hmm. Yes. And Lebanese sheikh. Uh, so Christopher Plummer as Mike Wallace lies there and whatever. And he's this, got his classic kind of like Mike Wallace yeah, and a cargo got, vest. Like, vest. Yeah, yeah, right, exactly. Right. Yeah. And he's sitting there and the sheikh's people, the sheikh's people want him sitting further away. A little bit further away. And it becomes yeah. this pissing contest. Right. And Mike Wallace gives this long impassioned speech about when I just sit down for interviews, nobody tells me where I'm going to sit. Right. And you're sitting there going, yeah, journalism. Yeah, journalism. Yeah. And then it, finally they come to an agreement and Lowell Bergman Al Pacino pulls, pulls my turn him aside. in the chair just over a little bit. Yeah, and then and then he pulls him aside and says, uh, "You want to, you know, you want to warm up some more? You're good to go." Like, right. and he goes, "No, I got the heart rate." Like, and the whole thing is basically an act. Yeah, that's and just I, like it's like him working the speed bags right. or whatever. But right. I just thought yeah, to myself yeah, yeah. that 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 tells you more about TV journalism than all of broadcast news did. Like, just in that one scene. And right, just, I love broadcast. Sure, no, sure, no, I, I'm sure. not. That's not. No, but I know what you're saying. Right, right, I know what you're saying. Right, right, right. Have you? I guess it hasn't been. It was at Sundance, but there's a documentary about like Mike Wallace this year. I forget what it's called, but it's like Mike Wallace something that is so good about what you're talking about. That he wasn't like a hard journalist. Like he'd been a pitch man. He hosted game shows. Like he was mm-hmm. one of those early TV guys. But he was so fucking great on camera yeah. as long as he once he was like in personality right. that he became like the most ice cold interviewer in the world yeah yeah but it's he just, was an it's, asshole it's just too. so much of it was a huge asshole theater. it's just yes, yes it's, theater. Theater. it's performance theater, right. it's, it's, it's so he was, performative he was like one of the first people who figured out how to use a television camera on him. yeah you know what i mean but that's also like uh that, that's like what fucking actors do like most sure, big right. movie stars have like weird things like that that they have to do to get into a scene. Sure, you won't film a second of the tick until you've yelled at a shake, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> which really uh, ate into our like a milkshake. Yeah, milkshake. Yeah, it's yeah. actually yeah. master yeah. shake. Yeah, from, yeah right. Yeah. So oh, they bring yeah. out master shake yeah. from Aqua Teen Hunger Force and I yell at him. Yeah. Right. Um, no, but there's stuff like the the thing in Wolf of Wall Street, the weird chest bumping, pounding, rhythmic yeah. thing mm-hmm. that McConaughey does. Mm-hmm. That's right. what he does before every take. Hell yeah! And Scorsese was the first guy to be like, "Can I film that?" Right, right. And he's like, "This is how I find it," you know. <laughs> but there's so many things like that where you hear like this actor needs to like make jokes on set until like the moment before they call right. action, or this person needs to like get into an antagonistic fight, right. you know, right? Whatever it is, and it like makes it clear like this guy's a performer. Like even but, though well, he does have serious journalistic intent, right? And that's the point, like. For actors, it's like okay, yeah, you expect that, right? You know, but growing up watching sixty minutes, yeah, you would never have thought any of this was. Per- we were not told right, any of this right. was performance, right? You know, and as we were talking about right before we recorded, it is kind of crazy that sixty minutes was just the biggest show in America. Yes, yes. like it the number was one show. Ratings, weird ratings wise. when yes. it got dethroned yes. by a scripted show. But the thing is, for uh, for a lot of us of a certain age, and maybe maybe for you guys too, who are like two or three years younger than me. Um, oh, I thought I was older than you. But, I, sorry, again, yeah, I'm no, just dazzled okay. by the sight yeah, of you. No, I understand. I understand. Right. Um, that ticking fucking clock meant right. school was coming around the corner. Oh, because it's a Sunday night. And I had right. flat, yes. like I had forgotten right. that yes. until watching this movie again this week. And I like I was sitting there actually shaking when they were playing that thinking because all it meant was football was over, and because right after football on CBS, then. 60 Minutes would come on, yeah. and then you knew it was like, oh, I got to do my homework. Yeah, this is it. This, this is, is it. it. There's no more procrastination uh, windows. And that, yeah. and that was life uh, I up. did not watch football. My brother and father always did. My bedroom was off the living room. I just realized that I had the exact same sex when you heard trigger the, the from ticking. the ticking. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. I'd be in my bedroom, locked door, uh, you know, br- browsing uh, uh, Oscar w- websites Oscar or forms, whatever. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, uh, watching cartoons, and then uh, I'd hear the ticking. I'd be like, God fucking damn it. Yeah. yeah. Um, I was saying though, I I remember like going to like like dinner parties with like my parents' friends, and then being like, we have to finish in time to, and then sitting around a TV with like twenty adults who are just wrapped in silence watching sixty minutes like it was Game of Thrones. Yeah, right. Yeah, because there was no, you know, there was no CNN, yeah, MSNBC, Fox, whatever. No, and you basically you had your local news, you had your network nightly news. And then you had 60 Minutes, because this was before 
you know, tw- even 2020 and Dateline. Right. We were talking those about, are the those sort of the copycats. Later. Right. Yeah. Right. But it was the flashier sort of. Yeah. And everybody watched it. And it was just it was unreal. It was all and about I- Rooney. Right. That's what we're, that's what we're all Rooney. tuning in for. Look, yes, of course, Andy Rooney, the original I mean, comedian. Yeah. 60 minutes. Got- the hottest of takes. I remember seeing him at a Vite the Mob. And it just like blow like I didn't know you could do that. <laughs> this is the crazy you know? thing. This is the, I saw this Matt is a Ruffy crazy piece thing. a couple yeah. of times. He went, this is new. Let's see if this is anything <laughs> from I mean, his notebook. For, What's the deal? For one thing, sixty. I don't like it. Sixty minutes <laughs> was the number tokens. one. The number one show from it was number one show five years. Yeah. Um. It was or you know and it wavered between like six to one for sure. fifteen years. Yeah. Um. Last the last 2017 season, mm-hmm. it was the number 12 show That's in America. Amazing. Really, like, it's not like 60 Minutes is some piece of shit now. No. You right. know, I mean, I assume that it's probably I not great those in the demo. Number, as they I say. would also yes. imagine those numbers are much lower than they oh, were back sure, then. For sure, but, sure. but I mean, but still, still, like a no, 12, absolutely a 12 Nielsen rating. That's 20, like that's amazing. Crazy. Yeah. And the thing that's that this movie... almost NCIS territory. <laughs> well, yes. I mean, and I, again, I assume audience overlap with NCIS sure. is yeah. heavy. Yes. <laughs> Very uh, they heavy. do a lot of crossovers. <laughs> I yes. bet they do. Honestly, I'm sure Mark Harmon has done yeah. some, some Well, 60 Minutes that. New Orleans is actually not <laughs> bad. <laughs> what? Is it 60 Rolling minutes Stone? Cyber. Is, the, is that the, the Rolling Stones are always in the theme song? No, The Who. The Who. The who oh, but the that's who. not in that's CSI. CSI. That's the CSI. CSI. I already did oh, my rant. Boy. Yeah. So I did sorry. my rant boy. about the CSI theme songs on a podcast like it's 1999, yeah. the Mystery Man episode. You can hear it. It's like masterpiece. Is NCIS just, or is it like, they don't use like a band songs. They right? don't. Yeah. They don't. I, know yeah, I think it's pretty fast. Yeah, I, right. I am addicted to, I have never seen a single episode of NCIS mm-hmm. uh, in primetime. Uh-huh. But those USA right, the the marathons. and PAX, yeah. Okay. Ec- yeah. ION, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. If that comes on on a weekend, I will throw that on really? TV. On a wow. rainy day, that is on for eight hours straight. Yeah. Uh, the, yeah. the thing that's kind of uh, incredible in this movie, and, you know, I'm not someone who's bemoaning. Uh, yeah, it's how much, just some piano music. Uh, better things were in the old days. I think things constantly move forwards and backwards simultaneously. But there is something kind of romantic about the idea of something like 60 Minutes holding so much power. It's like this one show can change the entire conversation in a night. Everyone will watch it. And if this story is covered on this show, it's indisputable. It's out. Right. You know? I agree with you. Yeah, so and, you're sort of waiting for the 60 minutes take. And the fact that this movie is taking place within the same year as the Unabomber right. and the OJ trial right. is like this is this year where like news becomes like huge like real life sort of soap opera right. ratings like bonanza sort of stuff. But this is also – it's just crazy to think that like in the 90s, cigarette CEOs could – plausibly just sort of be like that's we really we were just putting some leaves in a tube yeah, what do we know we had no idea yeah. oops right, yeah, i don't I know guess everyone's yeah. addicted yeah, i like, mean looking back at it now it's just like even that we all kind of knew like i'm trying i was trying to remember we all knew they were lying yes. basically but sure but that but they were still able to get away with it <laughs> sounds like someone else like, i know right you know what i'm saying someone else in an office an oval office it's remarkable watching it now and, and realizing that because this was not in my that, lifetime, not that yeah. long ago, no, no. Right, that there was an argument like people could sit there and say with a straight face or lying under oath saying, uh, I do not believe that nicotine is addictive. When anyone who has ever smoked a cigarette knows right. that nicotine is addictive. That's like what cigarettes are. That's the, You're addicted yeah, to them. Yeah. And also for so long within the vernacular, people say, you know, it's like nicotine. Right. Yeah, to exactly. Describe right. Things that, yeah, are, that addictive. are addictive. Right. right. But yeah, the, the the whole like life cycle of the various life cycles of cigarettes were in the sixties, everyone was sort of like, All right, maybe they're a little bad for you. I right. guess everyone's teeth are turning but black and on. everyone's coughing all it's the time. It's so cool. And then by the nineties they're like, Look, okay, we, we know they're bad, we'll give you a warning. But like they're right. they're probably not addictive or yeah. anything. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and now I don't know. Cigarettes, I guess people still have them. Now everyone's juuling. That other scene, too, where they're all sitting around the table and everyone other than Debbie Mazur knows what's going on. Mm-hmm. When they say, like, they have literally never lost a case. Right. right. Like, that's the big difference is, like, they're still litigious as fuck. They still will destroy people's lives. They still will do anything they can to avoid paying out. But now, in the last 20 years, you know, 25 years, Big Tobacco loses. Sure, sure. They have to make concessions, right. yeah. you know? Oh, yeah, yeah. They have to back down. Up until that point in time, they were just like... Well, also, like, now you can't advertise cigarettes. Right. 
but they're anywhere. Right. But their new thing is they're getting into the marijuana game. Yes. Well, that's and, what they should do. Yeah, and no, like you said, things go in both ways. Right. That's where you pivot. Uh, uh, of that, like seeing this movie again, I'm like thinking like, what are they going to do chemically right. to, sure. the marijuana. to sure. make the marijuana yeah. they sell even more yeah. addictive? Get right, some right, ammonia right. in there. Uh, what if they're like marijuana with nicotine? Yeah. Delicious. <laughs> mm. um, that's a good call. But yeah, like imagine that. Like if you watch a TV show, Netflix is like, and you know, now with our new nicotine stick, like inject right, as right. you watch yeah. Stranger Things. Yeah. And you're like, I gotta watch more Stranger Things. Like, it'd be crazy if yes. you were allowed to do that. Yeah, that's also made me realize I've never seen any. Like, is there a movie where somebody duels? Oh, Maybe not good yet. Question. Like, I keep waiting for that. The only I mean, time I'm I, working on a script. Sure. Yeah. The only time I've right ever now. seen something close was on uh, comedians in cars getting coffee when mm -hmm. Seinfeld was. In, I think it was Chappelle. Chappelle had one in his hand. Yeah. Like the whole time they were at the diner. But uh, but I've never seen anyone. Jewel in a movie, and I'm I don't like, think so. Now, I was, I was, I was thinking because um, I saw a movie where the language we all know of, like someone's been uh, cramming all night and they have they're stuffing uh, cigarettes into uh -huh. an ashtray. Yeah. Now it's going to be a pile of jewel pods. Yeah. And that's how you can tell a character's been cramming all. How night. long does it take to go through a pot normally? Ooh, it depends on what kind of mood I'm in. Yeah. I could probably, I could probably I guess burn two is, like, in a day. So, like one pot equals how many cigarettes? Really? Yeah. One pod's a pack? Yeah. And how uh, many pods are you on a day, Andy? Me? Yeah. One. Oh, good man. Because my dad was a two-pack-a-day smoker. Okay. Whoa. But that required so much fucking time. Yeah. Like, literally, just you had to, like, go through 40 cigarettes right. You could also do it on the plane. You could right. do it everywhere right. you right. went. My dad on the plane, once they banned smoking, was really? a problem. Yeah, my dad, problem. my dad was yeah. not great. What would he do? Too be a fucking pain in the ass <laughs> <laughs> eat uh what do you call it, the gum like oh, the yeah. chew the gum like crazy uh, uh, you know what's the thing that really worst. scares me in this movie and it's not like this is a thing that uh doesn't exist in the world today but the like the whole seven dwarves thing mm. of like here are the seven ceos right. of the tobacco company and and prioritized above them competing with each other is like we're all a united front that has to compete against everyone else right 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 like this like code of like secrecy of honor yeah of just like, look, it benefits us all right. if we're not, right. you know, fighting each other. Yeah. I mean, that's the other crazy thing about cigarettes. They all made the same product. Right. And yet somehow there were seven of them. Yeah. I also didn't realize Joe Camel, real guy. He real was guy. a real guy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And surprisingly yeah. large role in this film. Yeah, yeah, the scene where Mike Wallace screams at him for 10 solid minutes is right. pretty effective. And I think F. Murray Abraham is good in the role. You're a shell. <laughs> Get out of my job. face, you stooge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if I ever would nail a Joe Camel biopic. <laughs> Franklin Jella, maybe? Franklin Jella. You need that kind of voice. You definitely... Joe Camel has, like, a low, smooth, buttery baritone, right? All right. So after that electric first scene that we just talked right, about. Right, gauze over his eyes. Love six that Six inches of height hair. Yeah, hair oh, height. My God. Right. Right. Uh, yeah, he's almost got, like, a Phil Spector level. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes, Phil Spector. What what happened for that movie was they took the the piece off of yeah. Pacino here and they like put it in some kind of like growth chamber, <laughs> and then when it was time to make Spector, they just pulled it right back out. Yes, yeah. Um, it's like the thing in Life. Yes, yes. Yeah. Underrated movie. You're yeah. a lot of yeah. underrated. I, know, life. Life. Yeah. I think it's rated just fine. Yeah, fine. R. Yeah, it's rated. <laughs> it's a gross movie. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it, yes, that that tells you everything you kind of need to know about these two guys and how they approach their careers and their work. Uh, it's really, really good fucking writing. And the yeah, well, and I will say, uh, this is man's best script. Like he's a great writer yeah. in general, but usually you think of him like as a visual guy and a performance guy. You know, and his scripts are very like workmanlike, and you know, they got good lines maybe. Mm. But you, you know what I mean? Like this is his best script. It's all maybe talk. Eric Roth. Well, we wrote it with Eric Roth. Wow. They're co-credited. You I give mean, Roth a lot of the credit for this I one? I would imagine. Yeah, you think man came in there and he's like, make the wife more of a pain in the ass. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't like this. I'm sort of, I'm sympathizing with the female character. <laughs> yeah. Get her out of here. Yeah. Yeah. Two-dimensional. Well, there's, there's <laughs> yeah, can we cut one dimension? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. That's Christopher Nolan, too, like... Um, yes, can the wife be a uh, oh, zero dimensional, yeah. please? Yeah. Uh, what if the wife was um, less alive? What if she was a, mm, I don't want to say a ghost, but mm, <laughs> what do you think? Spectre. You guys like, you mean like a ghost? Yeah. Yes, uh, well, yes, Interesting perhaps, idea. Perhaps, yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> and they bring him Dunkirk and he's like, are there any wives? Like, 
there's not a single wife in this That's fucking movie. It's a go movie. picture. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but the the fact that this movie takes so long to set up these characters in such great detail, set up the world, set up their separate jobs, all of these things, the points don't really start converging until like 45 minutes in. I mean, my, right. my girlfriend who didn't really, uh, TC14, uh, know of this yeah. movie Be before food. we started watching it together, was like, it, I just paused. It took 45 minutes until this movie reveals what it's about, uh-huh. clearly. That's a you fair know? point, right? Because we're cutting to Wigand, um, but yeah. it's a little uh, more. I would argue it takes longer than that. Mm-hmm. Uh, arguably. Because what the movie, well, maybe that's not completely fair. No, no, go ahead. Because the first, the first half of the movie or whatever is 60 minutes the good guys, the unblemished good guys. Right. right. They're the heroes of journalism. And tobacco companies, the bad guy. And then ha- halfway through the movie, or whatever point that is, the movie is about 60 minutes being the bad guys all yes. of a sudden. Right. And that's a complete shift. Yeah. From the, and that, that's really... Because I mean, tobacco otherwise, is still number one bad guys. But no, 60 course. men, they basically get their claws in CBS corporate. Those, all yeah. the ways right. uh, but to if, the top. But if 60 minutes hadn't fucked this up, the way they did, right. this still would have been like a really good one hour movie. Yes, absolutely. About, right. about it's like Jeffrey Wigand versus the tobacco company. A whistleblower company movie and, and, and yay you know, right. journalism and, and whatever. Tell story. But that, yeah. That's what makes it a near three hour epic. Uh, no, and, it, and what makes it fantastic is right. that it, it completely shifts, it, it, much in the way that I think like Serenity did. There's a huge shift halfway through that yeah. sends it into the realm of a classic. Wait, wait, and there, you there was are a twist. speaking my language. There's a twist in Serenity? Uh, it's Randy? No. Oh, okay. No, no, okay. zero twist. It's a very logical film. You know, this is my it take on Serenity. Rules. It has rules. It has rules. It has a personification of the rules. At this point, so I'm just checking. Yeah, at this point, John Wick 3 will have come out. I'm not spoiling anything. It has rules. But yeah. it has Please a character who functions cause... similarly, who is basically like, I am the rules. Okay. Very similar type But I am the character. rules is the best line of dialogue. I, yes. Yeah, yeah, that's yes. ever. Yes. In the history, in the history of, of movies. Absolutely. Right. It, it, has, of it movies. has topped, here's yeah. looking at you, kid. Yeah. That's true. I am the yeah. rules. Yeah. In fact, they're actually going to redub uh, Casablanca so that at some point uh, Rick says, I am <laughs> Maybe the not rules. today, maybe not tomorrow. I am the rules. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're going to redub everything. You know, The Godfather. I'm the rules. <laughs> like, that's, it's going to be like that at the opening, right? De Niro saying, I'm the rules in the mirror. The end of Citizen King. Yeah. End of Citizen King. Rules. Rules. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, it's Serenity's a masterpiece. Yeah. Uh, Stephen Knight. I told, I said this yesterday to you. You didn't react. I said, Stephen Knight is an important artist because we were talking about Locke. I was agreeing with you. I know. It's not like you were like, get the fuck out of here. Yeah. But I think you should have been like, David? Genius thing to say. Great job. And clap me on the back. I did not realize we talked about this yesterday that Stephen Knight is one of the creators of Who Wants to Be a Millionaire. Right. Because someone really? in our Reddit said, like, oh, Serenity is Stephen Knight cashing in that Who Wants to Be a Millionaire check. And I was like, what? Did he win <laughs> on the show? Is that how he self financed this movie? Which is not a blank check, as we, as we said to each right, other. That right. is a $1 million right. That's check. That's a pretty defined yeah, yeah, yeah. set check. But he was one of like four creators of the show. Wow. And it's just presumably continued making money hand over fist forever and ever and ever and ever. And I imagine that as the creator of the show, his like notes were things like, uh, what if the music's serious? Yeah, right. Exactly. So it's this thing where you have to answer questions and you win a million pounds. And Steve Knight comes in and he's like, turn the lights down. And they were like, <laughs> great, you get a creator credit. <laughs> um, who wants to be a millionaire? Well, remember then that was the number one show on yeah. television. Yeah. That was the number one show on television. That was the number one, one show on television. Just but for a year. You were talking about ER being number one. Yeah. ER is the show that dethroned 60 right. Minutes. And there were like, you know, years where like Friends would be number one or sure. this or that. Any of those sort of must-see TV. But very right. often yeah. in the last 20 years, the number one show has been some form of reality television. Yeah. Whether it's a game show right. or a reality competition. Because it was American Idol for a long right. time. Right. It was once to be a millionaire for a yeah. year or two. Yeah. yeah. Survivor definitely for yeah. a year. Yeah. Right. Uh, I can run it down for you. Probably. I mean, what was the last scripted show to be the number one show on television? NCIS. That's that would a be my good bet. Yeah, it has question because right? that was. I mean, it is. Isn't yeah, it? I think it is. No. What? The Big Bang Theory was number one. Really? With a was the number, has been the number one show on television for the last two years. Wow! Wow! Se- number two, NCIS. Wow. Young Sheldon, Ben is pointing to Young Sheldon at number six, doing strong. <laughs> ben is uh, holding up six fingers and dancing. The, the um, Sheldiverse is just out of control. Young Sheldon uh, is number six of all shows on television? I mean, 
it's young Sheldon. Yeah. I had He's no idea. Young. <laughs> what is the premise of that show? Uh, what is Sheldon oh, but young? Yeah. <laughs> solves mystery. Does he? Yeah. What, what does he actually do? Uh, I, I think he learns a uh, kind of uh, winsome lessons. What if it was just him like doing a lot of like reading of textbooks, which is sort of what Sheldon, I assume, does do. Yeah, I think the show is kind of... It's like him learning to code and, I don't know, theoretical I physics. Think the whole hook to that show is that his dad seems like a gruff kind of unemotional guy. Okay. But at the end of every episode, the dad goes like, you know, Sheldon, I know what's been going on here. <laughs> his you know, dad's Robert Prosky. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or Robert Loja. Yeah. <laughs> Uh yeah, uh, who's his dad? He like, grows up in the south, and no Lance one gets Sheldon. Barber. Okay. And the dad seems like kind of like a a glump. And at the end of every episode, he's like, "I get it, kid. Oh, yeah. You're smart. You're gonna someday. Someday you'll live in an apartment <laughs> with a <laughs> bunch of nerds. <laughs> someday you'll live next to a girl. <laughs> this real piece of meat's gonna move in next door. I don't know. What's isn't that the premise of Big Bang? Yeah, Theory? the premise of Big Bang Theory is <laughs> what if nerds live next door to an a attractive girl? woman? Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah, Sunday Night Football, NCIS have been trading off for years, and then before then is the many-year run of American Idol. What's right. the football show about? <laughs> uh, it's like, what if on Sunday night people play football? Interesting. Yeah. Like, people play football yeah, like, Sunday like, yeah, day. If, you, if yeah. you watch during the day on Sunday, there's football games on, uh -huh. right. and then what they'll do is they'll... The sun will set. The sun will, the sun will <laughs> sure, go down. Sure, sure, yeah. sure. <laughs> and, like, they'll wait, like, an hour or two, Great. and then they will play another one. I it's love, a different game. Yeah. It's yeah, not the no, same oh, game no, yeah, running yeah, yeah, from day until night. Yeah, yeah. Game, yeah, huh. football. Right. 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 It is in general Red game. iron football. Uh, different match. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and then before that, it's CSI for a while. Right. Before that, you got Survivor. God, CBS and just And Who Wants really to Be a Millionaire. holds on to that spot. They rarely let it go. And before that, it is just ER and Seinfeld trading places right. for years. And, and before, before that, that 60 it's 60 Minutes. minutes. And then if we keep going, it's a, uh, oh, I've never heard of this. The Cosby Show? Is that, who's that? Uh, oh, we're not talking? Well, I, I do mean, think CBS is Andy's the network of the people room. who can't figure out how to change turn, turn Netflix on. Right. It's But it's kind of. <laughs> no, I mean, I think, that, yeah. I don't even no, mean truly, that. truly, truly. I guess maybe sounds yeah. mean. I don't even yeah. mean no, you're, it you're meanly, right. you're but right. I yes. think it's, you know. I, I think you are 100% uh, correct. And it is like the reason why they still run the table on network. Yeah. Yeah. CBS is the AOL of, right, like, right. TV. Right. right. No one ever told them that you can just get internet on a browser now. Right. I had to check my AOL recently. Your what? My AOL account. You have an, you AOL, still have account? an AOL account? Yes, I do. Oh, you, do wow. you pay for it? No, I don't. Okay. Okay. I think my dad was paying for it for a while. <sighs> but I still have the email Griffin, address. it's going to come back. They just bought uh, Time Warner. It's Look, going yeah. great. My You're at an age now. You shouldn't be still be on your parents' AOL account. Hey, listen. This my socialism <laughs> crap is out of control. <laughs> My father, I just want to be clear on the record. You know, you should be on it. AOC. My father. She's going straight to the top. My father. I'm sorry. <laughs> responds to. Oh, that was hysterically funny. My father. Your father responds to. <laughs> responds to emails mm -hmm. from his AOL account on his BlackBerry. Wow. That's my father's life is getting that's a really old, AOL that's an old phrase. <laughs> Respect. With the Blackberry signature. That's like the old country, you know. Oh yeah. Oh, my, Blackberries. My father <laughs> I loved my Blackberry when I had one. It was great. Well he, I, I, I Griff, I like having the buttons. I like having <laughs> yeah. feeling the thing. But he my father sends emails that should be texts. So he sends emails going, You okay? That's the subject uh, heading. Right. Uh-huh. No body. <laughs> <laughs> great. And then it's just uh sent from Blackberry, the most secure mobile device. <laughs> Which he types out. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, right. Every time. Yeah. Yes. It is crazy that that was a narrative for a long time. I was like, well, I need the buttons. It's like the button is the size of a freaking P. Yeah. <laughs> I have to say I miss I miss the keyboard. I liked I my BlackBerry a lot. Yeah. I, I, I very much enjoyed my, my years with BlackBerry. I do like the people who still have sent from my iPhone as a signature, though. Mm -hmm. I, otherwise, how would I know? Yeah. Where, yeah. Where you know? A, it's important to know. Yeah. Yeah. And who? B, it's like, what is this new this iPhone an thing? An iTelephone? Oh, yeah. Some kind of space computer? I have a wall telephone. You have an iTelephone? In the ball? <laughs> yeah, right. Right there? Right in here. In the eyeball? <laughs> For the listener, Griffin and I are pointing at our eyeballs. <laughs> our eyeballs. All right. Um, so, yes. Let's talk I mean, th this, <laughs> The Michael Mann thing where it's like just like two fucking lines, like just slowly inching towards each other until they form a right angle. Sure. You know, like I feel Hot. like all his movies are like. You just described pornography to me. Yes. That's what that is. <laughs> right. 
But you have a lot of time setting up, and and mm-hmm. Weigand and sure. Bergman start to cross paths. But yeah. it's this weird thing where, uh, I mean, this is what's so beautiful about this character. And uh, Roth and Mann did an insane amount of research for this movie. Yes, this is one of the few movies based on true story that at the end has the disclaimer like. You know, some of these things didn't happen. We tried our, our hardest. Yeah. To yeah, right. Whereas yeah. usually they'd be like, everything in this movie is right. true as yeah. like uh, Bohemian or, Rhapsody. Or goes. that's right. the legal disclaimer they have to put at the very at the end. end of the right. credits. And right. man has to be like, I have to admit, right. I've fudged a couple of things right. to right. make the movie flow better. I condensed right. a couple yeah. right. dialogue scenes. The uh, Bruce McGill lawyer was only 35% of a showboat. Okay. Oh Not 80. <laughs> that scene. What though. a performance. That scene oh, is. Oh my God. It should I want, be in museums. I want, that's a TV <laughs> right. show. Yes. Right. That scene should be the state song of Mississippi. Yeah. Like, yeah. Mississippi no. should enshrine like, that scene. I want, after that, you I'm want like, that show, like, like, Bruce McGill is a yelling Bruce lawyer. Bruce McGill, right. DA. It is or, actually, you know, call it whatever Bruce you want. Bruce McGill yells at <laughs> evil industry <laughs> oh, attorneys. Yeah. It is incredible that that wasn't on CBS. Wipe that smirk off your face. Right. <laughs> right? That Bruce McGill running a law firm in the South. I, I'm what, all in. That should have. Oh. God. Been running for 15 years on Absolutely. CBS. His suits have to be frumpy, though. Yes. Of okay. course. No, it can't course. fit him well. And every no. courtroom should be like fluorescent lights, <laughs> yeah. you know, card tables. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, bridge whatever chairs, that is. whatever that is. Okay, yeah. we gotta get to that scene. But, uh, yeah. We gotta get to that scene yeah, quick. I'm so excited. <laughs> Fuck. Uh, but, that, but there is the I mean, it's beautiful Pacino, like, gauze, you know, bandage. Oh, shit, we're still on the first scene? Yeah. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> How cool this moving. guy is. How he's back cool to the he actual cool. opening shot now. Yeah. He's cool. He's okay, cool. so it says touchdown pictures. Oh, no. <laughs> and the so logo like is a like, blue logo. What is that? The name of the circle. show is Blank Check. The name of the show is Blank Check. Um, but, but we Ooh. get Wygand uh, eating cake in his office, or watching people eat cake mm, in right. the lab. Mm. And uh, the world is heavy on his shoulders. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. And you realize very quickly as he goes home that he has been laid off. Been fired. For reasons that are unclear. This guy seems so milk toast. Sure. This guy seems so bland. Uh, when Roth and Mann met him, they said they thought it would be difficult to make a movie about him because they found him unlikable. <laughs> he, and he is in he the is movie. He quite and unlikable. Kirk does a really good film. job playing an Absolutely. unlikable guy. Absolutely. And you, his performance goes from this guy feels kind of unengaging to being this guy's actually actively unlikable. Yeah. The only yeah. scene in the whole movie he's likable in is when he's introducing the chemistry class. That's and he's good? being kind of like bashful, right. and he's like talking about what he likes about chemistry. I think there's one other example. He what? won te- Teacher of the Year, you know. Yes. I know. I, yeah. Oh, I, I was know. pumping my yeah. fist when yeah. that title card came up. Can you imagine how crazy it must have been for that guy to be your teacher? I know. When like, it was in like the middle was of all, all over this? the news, yeah. when they like cut in the middle of the battle, like to him just like writing on the chalkboard, right. and you're like, he has to, like plan still a lesson. teaching? Yeah, yeah. And everyone's like talking about his like failed child support in the news. It's true. He's getting bullets in the mail. He's yeah. getting bullets in the mail. Uh, the other scene that I think he's likable is when he explains uh, what's going on uh, to her, his daughter when she's having the asthmatic. Yes, yes, that's a very absolutely. good scene. Yes, of course. Yes, yeah. that's a good dad. And that's another good characterization thing where it's like this guy gets science really well, right? And he has no sort of like emotional yeah. like facility. Yeah. But if he can explain what's going on scientifically, yeah, he can connect to someone. But right. we were talking about. It. Earlier with, with Diane Verona and uh, or Breland, Venora, uh, Venora, uh, Venora. Yeah. Jesus, now I uh, now you're oh gonna pull a real griff. I used, I, I call her that all the time. It feels like her name should be Diane Venor- 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 Verona. Yeah. Verona. Yeah. yeah, because she was in Romeo and Juliet. Too. <laughs> right, yeah. right. Um, the scene. So he he has the boxes in the back of his car. Yes, and he runs out from dinner to go get more soy sauce. I think it was. Yeah. and she comes out <laughs> after him, and he's like. Those are my boxes in the car. She's like, why are your boxes in the car? And he says, uh, well, I didn't know where else to put. And it takes her like four questions right. for him right. to finally say, oh, I got fired today. Right. From that job we had yeah. that supports the whole family. So right. between that scene and then there's a scene later where uh, they, he and his wife go to New York mm-hmm. to, unbeknownst to her, he is going to tape. He doesn't thing. know why he they're does, at dinner with Mike Wallace. Yes, he doesn't <laughs> tell her he's there to tape this interview. Yes. But oh, meanwhile, God. so you have those two scenes. Clearly, this is not a good husband. No. No, he's no. kind of a pain in the ass. Yeah. And if he gets stressed out, what does he do? Start socking him away. But, he yeah. gets to the bar and he's yeah. like, all right, yeah. give and, me a double. And goes target shooting. And goes target shooting and maybe owns like, yeah. you know. A lot of guns, guns for one guy. Many yeah. different calibers, yes, apparently. Right. It is a thing I love about this movie, that Russell Crowe's performance at the beginning is so strange. Yeah. And then yeah. they just sort of unpack this guy. Yeah. 
And, like, he's playing the same guy the same way pretty much the whole movie, but the more details you get about him, the more it starts to make sense. But this key thing that, like, this guy is not a hero, this is kind of a shitty guy who, because of his anger issues, right. ends up doing the right thing. Yeah, Snowden. because the morality Almost of the thing every does decision he makes is... Snowden. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it took me a second. Right, uh, but he's not a Snowden. Like no, he's not a guy no, who's like trying to like pat himself on the back. He's no, a guy who like if someone intimidates him, he's like, "Fuck me, fuck you." Yes, yeah. I'm every gonna whistle blow. Every yeah. decision yeah. he makes is that right. Because yeah. like, there's that scene where the Mississippi DA is like, "Look, honestly, you probably shouldn't do this." Anyway, I gotta go. Right. And yeah. Crow's <laughs> like, "Yeah, what should I do? Let's fuck it. Let's go to court." Yeah. You know what I mean? He's just got a chip on his shoulder. He's also, got a chip on his shoulder. I was a little yeah. annoyed though. The, the fuck me, fuck you. Like, how would, did Pacino not get that line? I know. I know. That's My true. God. Fuck me. Fuck you. He says. I'm. He 100 percent says that in Angels in America. Yeah. He just got it later. Someone said <laughs> it to him, and he was like, oh, oh. So "I actually I get, looked. I up, get to do that later." I looked. Does he say it in that? Because I looked up. In I Angels did a, in America. I did a search for a fuck, fuck me, me, fuck you, fuck Al Pacino, you. and could not find really? it. There's the whole speech in Angels in America where he starts screaming at Jeffrey Wright. Uh, I could have sworn he said fuck, fuck me. I'm pretty sure also that's what Al Pacino says when you ask him for an autograph. <laughs> right. Uh, Mr. Pacino, I loved your performance in China Doll. China the, Doll. The people man. waiting backstage. That's the one. That's my joke is that they're waiting it's by the so stage crazy, door. Though. Fuck is it? me. Fuck you. Uh, yeah, because that's it. No, it's right. It's not. He never says that quite, but it's the whole thing. Is like, was it legal? Fuck legal. What about the nation? Fuck the nation. Right where he. I, I love Angels in America. Pissed off and curious is my favorite line of his in this movie. Mm. Yeah. I, mean, I love the line that I think I tried to suggest to you, um, which happens in that scene where uh, the wife storms out of the di- the drinks with mm-hmm. the dinner with Wallace. Where oh, Wallace that is, is like, who are these yeah. guys? Yeah. And I want to find the exact line. Do you remember it? I do not. Uh, it's what do you expect from that? They're, they're ordinary uh, people. Under ordinary a- people under extraordinary pressure, Mike. Yeah. What the hell do you expect? Grayson's consistency? Yeah. I just love that. Yeah. Like, I also love it where Wallace is like, and he delivers it really well. So, too. Well. like, it's so just. Good. But like, Wallace's life is more like I, I deal with like very, very fancy people. Yes. Like, and total like, who are these jerks? Yeah. And Lowell's right. like, my job is to find these people, yeah. and they're not gonna be like yeah. you, you know. But also, I started getting the feeling at that point that maybe this story was being told more from Bergman's point of view than Wallace's. Sure. Sure. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of sure. course. Like right. no, I mean obviously, but it was like after it was like, oh, okay, we get it. You're you're the man of the people, you're the good guy. He's you're, the right. He's but, but I also think I mean the film ends up selling Bergman as like a very self destructive, self righteous guy in a not entirely noble way. Even though he is the one who ultimately triumphs. I feel like really? when you're introduced to Pacino, he seems so together. The guy's so calm and collected right, in right. these extreme circumstances. Right. And when you compare his home life to, like, Wygant's home life, it's like, oh, the kid's coming into bed with them and kiss on the cheek and they're reading the paper and everything's good. And I feel like even though he ultimately succeeds, the movie, like, I I think the movie argues that this guy's sort of ego tied to the sanctity of the idea of Mm. journalism is kind of his undoing. At the end of the movie, he's kind of fucked. Like, he's sort of destroyed he's doing I fine didn't get that at really? all yeah. yeah the end of the movie they should be like by the way you leaked like that private yeah. tape to the new york times you're so fired and instead mike wallace is like yeah you got what you wanted who cares right it's fine yeah and i mean was like, no i quit yeah. i'm gonna go be a professor at usc <laughs> or whatever wherever yeah. he ended up uh, berkeley berkeley yeah. berkeley, yeah. berkeley yeah. right but he does get to deliver that great line, what got broken here doesn't go back together again. Yeah, which I think is fair, actually. Is I, I think you're right. That's what The Insider is mostly about, right? Yeah, it's right. like that 60 Minutes has this lofty view of itself. Yeah. Of course, we would never be like swayed by business interests mm. or anything like that. Stephen Tobolowsky, we'd never be swayed by Stephen Tobolowsky. <laughs> <laughs> and the most pivotal scene and one of the best scenes in the movie is the Gina Gershon scene where she's like, I'm totally on your side, guys. We just have to run it by legal and start saying things that make no sense. Yeah, yeah. And Pacino's like the only one who's like, yeah. what is she saying? Yeah. Oh, you mean that scene that That's feels it. like when I ask people why there hasn't been a Funko of Arthur yet? <laughs> it, is it, and it's Gina Gershon who tells you, right? Is that also I mean, like a, in a snappy appearance? I'm telling you. Is that you, what they say? The emails I get read exactly like that. <laughs> it's like, I know you're saying a lot of stuff, but I don't really think you're saying anything. That's... Uh, <laughs> It's like with tortious interference, the more tortious interference, the more true the thing is, right, the right. worse it is right. for them because it's 
So I think with the Funko That's Pop, what the president of Funko said to me. He said, this is an issue of tortious interference. Did he, did, <laughs> no, no, he didn't. He said, because the cooler it would be, right, right. The, the less l- they can do it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now, when you get the email, does it like bounce on your monitor first like of a all, weird old first of all, school animated <laughs> like, <laughs> which I have never seen outside of a movie. Yeah. No, that doesn't exist. It's got wings on it. It does right. have little, yes. little early pixel GIF wings. <laughs> Love that scene. We're talking multiple emails here. I was like, like three months ago. You remember? I was like, I think I finally solved this thing. And I was emailing between Sony, Amazon, and Funko. Right. And it got caught in this kind of boondoggle. Right. Someday I'm going to sell the rights to Michael Mann. And he's going to make a story about me trying to make a Funko of myself. God, imagine if, imagine trying to tell Michael Michael Mann what a Funko pop is. Like, imagine (laughs) the disdain. (laughs) Like, if I've got uh, five minutes with Michael Mann, you know, I'd be like, oh, he's, I, I admire him so much. He's like one of my favorite directors. And for some reason, the only circumstances under which I'm allowed to talk to yeah. him is if I have to explain what a Funko Pop is to him. <laughs> with like Miami Vice characters yeah, or something. Yeah, I'm like, anyway, so yeah, they all kind of look the same. They got big eyes. Uh, they stand about But their eyes high. are like blank. Yeah, right. bl- black circles, right. you know, with kind of a... And it specifically has to be the Arthur Funko Pop that you have to yeah, describe. Yeah, Arthur. So, okay, the tick. Let me get into this fast. <laughs> this <is> the fourth <laughs> version. Yeah, right. Right, uh, yeah, so started out uh, like indie underground comics. Underground, self-published. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. okay, let's You might talk know about... the Fox series. You might remember right, that. Right, Fox or Kids, the, maybe which the really owned by Disney. It was uh, on before Eek the Cat. You're yeah. familiar with Eek the Cat. Yeah, let's talk about Eastman and Lard first uh, <laughs> before we can get even to Ben Edlund. Uh, yeah, and then yeah. Michael Mann, like, shoots me with a scatter gun. Right, he pinches you. <laughs> Uh, Lowell wants some cigarette background info first. He needs realizes, someone to translate. For yes, him. Some, he's but got then, this really dense dossier. Full he's received of, yeah. anonymous information. Right. Realizes that Wygand is kind of a perfect whistleblower. He's like a guy who's kind of ready to flip. He's been laid off. It's he knows beautiful everything. That he's just asking Wygand, "Can you translate this for me?" After they've had right. their weird facts exchange, that's right. like right. so so terse. Yeah. <laughs> But I also just love, like, just fucking two, like, middle-aged men standing over their fax machines waiting for handwritten one-sentence notes. Ah, the 90s. Yes. yes. It's so uh, good. The original Twitter. Right. So he's like, why is this guy this defensive? And then when he sits down with him in the hotel room, the guy's like, I just want to make it clear. I'm not giving you any more information. Right. And she was like, what other information? He's like, doesn't matter. I'm not giving you any of it. I'm not giving you any kind of information right, about like, ammonia. Right. He, like, volunteers <laughs> that he's not, not going to tell him anything Certainly not about else. the ammonia. Right, right. All of the secrets, I can't tell you them. Right. Um, what so, secrets? The ones I can't tell you. Right. Um, but the uh, thing is, I, like, I'm assuming, even though I, I know it's a movie and whatever, mm-hmm. I'm assuming that's how they met in real life. I believe 100%. Has to be. Has to be. Yeah. But yeah. it's really bad screenwriting if, right. it, if it were fiction. If yes. it were fiction. Right. You would, you would, like, you would fix what? that. It would be like, no, this is a really dumb coincidence. Like right after he gets fired, right after he gets fired, he's ready to spill the beans. Something else, and then he accidentally, or not but, accidentally, but he alludes to something else. But I mean, so many stories like that. It's no, always absolutely. like they stumbled into it yeah. by yeah. mistake. Yeah. And it totally makes sense for this guy with such a hair trigger, you know? Sure. Right. So, like, I mean, make these sort of like knee jerk decisions. Um, uh, and not be able to maintain his cool. And then early on, there's the scene with Michael Gammon that is fantastic, Mama. where they're essentially like, yeah, yeah you're going to give you a super confidentiality agreement yeah. in which you uh, agree to shoot yourself if yeah. you ever tell anyone anything, right? You know, like, that's uh, great. And then Crow just, like, flips out. Yeah. Yeah. Fuck me, fuck you. Has the conver- fuck everyone. Has the conversation. The I think he got it is, uh, is yeah. still a good kiss off line, though. <laughs> yeah. Uh, has the convo with uh, Al in the rainy car. There's a lot of rain. And and a great Michael Mann line is uh, Pacino saying, I don't burn people. That's when he thinks that Pacino has sold burned him. him. Right. I like the Knicks line in that scene. Yeah, you think the Knicks oh. make, make the semifinals? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what do we talk yeah. about? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, Outside your world. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, all that stuff with the two of them in the cars together. I remember and at the it, Japanese restaurant. Oh, so good! And he and he does that fucking thing. He like crosses the line like four times in three seconds. Yes, yes, he does. This good like call. very disorienting thing where he's literally just crossing the line in two shots, and he just goes from oh. one side to the other back and forth, uh, which is like very disorienting. It's this weird courtship phase of the movie. Yeah. Where it's just like Crow being like, I think I'm interested. Right. Invites Pacino out and then's like, fuck you, get away from me. <laughs> right. Um, uh, I remember not having seen this movie when it came out, Entertainment Weekly running an article, not maybe a full article, but a little half page thing about uh, how uh, distracting it was that the Pepsi girl was in the movie. 
Who's the Pepsi girl? Hallie Kate Eisenberg. Oh. Younger sister of Jesse Eisenberg. Yeah, right. Who plays Ro- uh, Russell Crowe's older daughter. Right. Oh but at God. this time was the spokesperson for Pepsi. And that campaign had started right after, Whoa. right before this movie came out. I would guess after she finished filming this, but before it was released. Uh. And talking about like trying to explain uh, fucking Funkos to Michael Mann. <laughs> could you imagine how angry he must have been when someone was like, she's the girl who like drinks a Pepsi and smiles. Right. And now people are laughing in the theater when she's on tra- introduced on screen. Right. Oh, my God. Uh, yeah, she was the Pepsi girl. How quickly we forget the Pepsi girl. The Pepsi girl. Um, very distracting. It distracted me from the whole... I couldn't pay attention for the rest of the movie. So I don't remember what happens after that. Yeah. Can you guys tell me? Uh, they finally... Uh, yeah, I mean... I mean, they, they're right. They start working on the thing where he has to testify so that they can, like, skirt his confidentiality. Like, they, he has to be, like, compelled to testify in court. And that's how they can get strategy. him on the record. Yeah. Right. And they have to go take him to Mississippi to do it, right? This is the because strategy. because the state of Mississippi has a lawsuit already. I think yes, pending right. or on 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 file. Right. Yeah. So someone tells Pacino this. Uh, so he, you know, they say he's basically tells Mississippi like depose Wygand. Right. He won't. You know, they won't be able to enforce the NDA. But right. Wygand is getting so angry about uh, right. the, the tobacco problem with the, muscling him. Right, right. And the bullet in the mailbox. And he's like, I have to film it now. And Pacino's like, I can't film it until you've been testified. He's like, you don't have to air it. Right. I just need to get the shit off my chest. Uh, so then uh, takes uh, his wife to New York City. You know, just a casual dinner with Mike Wallace. Yeah. It is wild. Well, maybe we'll catch a show. Right, as yeah. one does. Also, yeah. tomorrow I'm going yeah. to film well, six it, hours. It, like you were saying, like, again, Hollywood screenwriting, like, would not be like, t- would be like, you have to build to the climactic interview and have that right. be right. the big moment right. of release at the end of the movie. And instead, they do it like 50 minutes in. Right. right. And uh, the rest of the movie is about if they're allowed to air the right. interview completely or if they're going to edit it. And he kind of does the interview at that point out of petty anger. Yeah. Like, once again, sure. it's not like, I need to get this out to the people. He's like, I don't care when you air it. Right. I just need to fucking yell about these right. guys. Well, and then the interesting thing is, like, as part of the interview, Mike Wallace asks him, you know, do you have any regrets about coming out as a yeah. whistleblower? It's like, but he hasn't yet. Right. 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 He, at this and point, yet he's he, still like, yeah, I've and he's got still some like, regrets. Yeah, I've got some regrets. And, yeah. and, like, by the end of the movie, you understand why he would have regrets. Right. But at that point... Something, I guess the bullet thing had happened. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and he got the, fired. Yeah, I guess a couple he's of things like, had happened, yeah. But, yeah. but not to the extent like the, the dossier hadn't been prepared that we'll yeah. get to in a bit. And yeah. so at that point, it, it's, it's kind of weird yes. for him to already be like, yeah, for, just for that to happen. It is crazy when like he has the full security detail courtesy of Pacino mm-hmm. and he's like going in the fucking uh, like the, the carcade uh, with like all the police cars in front and behind. And that, like, everyone in the government agencies is just like, oh, he's speaking against Peck? Yeah, no, they're going to try to assassinate him. Yeah. Like, it is so accepted that this guy needs this much protection because, like, right. no, they will straight up try to murder him. Um, I, I watched... Uh, Not if the state of Mississippi has anything to say about well, it. Well, right. Mississippi, the last bastion of justice <laughs> in America. It's amazing. I do love that Mississippi is just presented <laughs> as, like, the purest, like, <laughs> that shit don't fly in Mississippi. <laughs> I'm, right. It's, it kind of cuts both Kentucky. ways. Kentucky. Yeah. yeah. Say North it's Carolina. North Carolina. South Carolina. Carolina. South Carolina. Yeah. That scene is phenomenal. <laughs> it's so, yeah. it's, it's so on good. YouTube, by the way. Is oh. it? I'm yes. going to watch it. Because I watched it, like, oh eight God. times yeah, last I'm going to get that scene tattooed on my body, frame by frame. I mean, Bruce McGill is in like what around five man movies right he's in everything yeah, like yeah. even if, he plays like a door if he's not gonna <laughs> right. have a speaking role right like he's so fucking good he's yeah. gonna he's good in collateral coming up yes um but uh that's his tour de force man a yeah. one shot right I think that's his best scene as an actor ever. i think it's the best scene actor. of an actor <laughs> yes <laughs> right yeah like an acting school 101 <laughs> everyone should yes. sit down and they'll be like uh, roll it, and yeah. you just watch that clip, and they're like, any questions? Just do what that guy did. But it is such an incredible thing of like, okay, like death threat emails, right? Bullet in the mailbox. Like, wife leaves him, security detail installed, like motorcade, like running for miles, getting him into what then turns out to be him essentially saying one sentence in, as you described it, a shitty fluorescent lit room. Right. Like, it's kind of incredible how, like, sort of nondescript... The actual action is yeah. of what he's doing. Yeah. McGill is theatrical, you know, the lead up to it's theatrical, but it's just like it, that was a line that was never crossed where this guy walking into the shitty Mississippi <laughs> office right. 
and just being like, uh, yes, I believe that it's addictive. I just, right. God, yeah. Right. The, the, the lawyer's like, you really can't say that. Yeah. Don't answer. Don't answer. Don't answer. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But that's the one sentence they're trying to get him to right. say on the right. record. Yeah. Right. right. Um, so that happens. Uh, the bullet in the mailbox, I can't remember if it's right after that or right before that. That happens concurrent with the email. Yeah, right. The it's wife hears it. Right. They've moved to the, the new FBI apartment. Because the FBI show up right. and they're like, Let, we'll just take your computer. <laughs> right. Did right. you touch the bullet? Right. Do you have a gun? Yeah. Like, they start thinking, because also at this point, uh, Pacino, like, does the due diligence of, like, tell me everything shitty about you. Yeah. Right. And Crow is, like, pretty forthcoming of, like, I have anger issues. Yeah. I have a shoplifting record. Right. I drink too I drink much. too much. Right. 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 I got in a physical fight with my wife once. <laughs> Sure. And right. you're like, okay, this guy's got some baggage. And then it turns out there's like a whole other suitcase underneath the table. Yeah. Although I think it was mostly bullshit because that's sort of what the oh, movie bears bullshit. out. Right? It was like kind of. It's mostly bullshit, but he's a messy guy. Yeah, he's a messy yeah. guy. Yeah. Um, We're all messy guys. We're all messy so. guys. I think that's one of the put one you of the under themes a of the microscope. Movie. Exactly. Right. You know, yeah. like. Exactly. What, um, the thing I was going to say, mm. watching this movie, appreciate so much about Michael Mann. This movie has some of the best instances of it. Mm. Uh, wh- what is often called in uh, filmmaking uh, shoe leather yeah. that mm. most directors get bored and want cut out. Sure. Let's just skip that. You just do this right away. Let's cut the shoe leather. Uh, usually makes scenes feel fucking wonky and hollow uh, is the kind of stuff that leads to like, why don't you ever see someone hanging up in a movie? Why do they never say goodbye? You right. know, why yeah, do you never see the, them? The, the classic, like William Goldman, like we don't need to see them hail a cab. Like we, we, we shouldn't see three cabs go by before they hail the cab. But they Mike, need to hail the cab, so they're going to hail a cab. Michael Mann is so good at making all that stuff tell you a lot about the characters. He's right. not showing it to you for the sake of showing it to you, right. but like the fact that every time anyone's on the phone in this movie, and this is a movie where people are often speaking to each other over the a phone. A lot of phone. Yeah, a lot of phone. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's always in the middle of them doing something else. There's mm, never a scene right. where Pacino's just like drinking a cup of coffee in his <laughs> living room. <laughs> Gotta take some calls. Right. Like it, the, <laughs> the most casual thing is him waking up in the middle of the night from sleep. Right. But when he's like in the edit bay and you see the craft of him establishing the edit of the segment. Yeah. And then he's taking the call in the middle of that right. and then he's giving more notes. It's like it's such good fucking character building and world building. Right. Um, so they have the piece. It's tight. It's ready. It's ready to they go. Watch it's it. locked. Like halfway locked. through the movie, locked. they all sit down and watch it. Yeah. Don't touch my like, film. It's good. Yeah. Right. Uh, right. And then they, there's the conversation with uh, Helen Caparelli. Mm-hmm. With Gina Gershon. It's a great like three scene performance. Yeah. I think it's a weird performance. Really? I love well, her in this. It's just, it's again. It's the character is so bad. Like yeah, that's that's my problem. Oh, you, you think it's too to, like one dimensional? Yeah, I think you even compare. Like I think in his movies when he has people just talking business, mm. the women are dumber. I don't think she's like dumb. I think Tobolowski speaks better than she does no, in terms of the actual a verbiage. Chin bearded fool in this movie. <laughs> hey, first of all, it's a good beard. Wallace demolishes him in yes. this scene. It's the other scene. Well, I, I'll wait till you get to it. Oh, let's get to it. Let's get to it. What do you mean? Well, no, because it's further on. Okay, w- okay. W- when you mean when the credits roll and we see all the names of the people who worked on yeah, the movie? That's yeah. a little later. I okay, guess. right. right. The, um, the best boy Griffin this way blew my. Mind. <laughs> <laughs> I did not see that. Coming. Well, okay. So what happens? No. I mean, go ahead. You go no, ahead. Because my thing is later. Is much later in the film. Fine. I feel like we're jumping around a lot. I don't want to too. ruin your yeah. chronology. Well, not here. really. It it's like to mean a lot they, to you, David. Once they get it down, once <laughs> they have the, the tape he down. He has the rules. Well, I grew up in England. We're, yeah. well, I did grow up in England. That's true. Where I saw what? this film with the Hollywood audience. Um, we're cutting between like the 60 minutes legal stuff. Right. right you know, and the, the sort of Lowell realizing they're getting further and further bogged down. Mm-hmm. And uh, because Jeffrey CBS Reagan. Is, is in the process of, of being bought. They're being they're being bought by Westinghouse, which right. apparently nobody knows except Lowell Bergman. That yeah. scene is the one scene that's really confusing, yeah, where he's like, was, "It's I, a sale, it's I, for real." I'm like, yeah. "I would be reported." I found this that would SEC be in the filing. Yeah, like, what, that, that right. CBS Corporation was being bought. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you found it. Right. Yeah. Whatever. Like maybe maybe that's movie, how it worked. I have no idea. Yeah. When like, he calls the guy in New Orleans and is like, "I did the research. Like, how many?" Of like uh, your FBI agents have been hired by That's private security scene. firms. Right. Like this is a guy who just reads every fucking dense document he can to try to find the connections. Yeah. He's like a very effective conspiracy theorist. Yeah. Right. Who like really backs it up. Yeah. Yes. Um. Yeah. We see him at home at, with Lindsay Krause and stuff. Yeah. I love Lindsay Krause. She's an amazing actress. Mm-hmm. She's got as you cannot nothing to do, to do in this movie, in this movie yeah. 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 Right. except be like the opposite of Diane Venora yeah. in Heat. 
Right. She's just like, yeah, no, go ahead, please yeah. read a Bible's worth of documents <laughs> I while saw, I make dinner. I yeah. saw her name at the in the opening credits. She's so which, as you pointed out, mm-hmm. you know, in, in like the twenty fifth minute of yes, the opening credits. Right. Yeah. And I was like, oh, I completely forgot she was in this movie. I can't remember who she plays at all. And by the end of the movie, I was <laughs> like, had the exact same oh, she in that one? Yeah. That's I why I couldn't she was remember where yeah. she was in this movie. She's so incredible in uh, House of Games. That's like one of my favorite performances. Yes. Um. Anyway. Uh, but oh no! So I'm saying we're cutting between that right. and Jeffrey Wigand sitting in various chairs while opera music plays. <laughs> yes, <laughs> right. And, and his wife leaves him off screen. Right. But mostly he just sits in chairs. Right. And they've developed this whole sort of like counter narrative against him to make him seem like a slippery character. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. Uh, the so, knives are out. For right. Him. So his name's being dragged in the press. Right. His interview is not being played. Right. His wife has left him. Yeah. Lowell is sort of saying like, "I'm sorry, I'm trying." You know, like that's all he's got for him. Right. Uh, that scene where where Pacino's just like, look, there's no good way to say this, so I'm gonna say it. Right. Interview's not airing. Yeah. Not great. Not great. <laughs> and then I'd Russell be Crowe does the like, I would definitely listen to some right. mind opera too. But Russell Crowe's uh, like pr- pretty effective. Like you have no idea what it feels like to be in my shoes. You cannot right. imagine right. what my life feels but like you, right now. Before that, though, there's in the scene with with Gina Gershon that we were talking about mm-hmm. earlier when when they when. Uh, basically, Mike Wallace and and Bergman get told. Yeah. Basically, it's the first version of you're not going to be able to. Air you're not going to be able to. Right. Air. right. And, and the, and the then, scene where it's all on Wallace. Well, the, and that's yes. the thing. The scene where as Bergman is becoming more and more Foster, Al Pacino ish, right. yeah, and, yeah, yeah, right. and yeah. his voice is you know reaching that perfect pitch. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and he's and he's expecting uh, he's expecting Wallace, Wallace to, back to back him back up. up. Yeah. And then you hear Wallace just say, "I'm I'm with." I'm with Don on I'm this. I'm with Don. The look on Pacino, Pacino does yeah, such a great terrific. job in that scene. There's just this look of like the st- he's so stunned and so betrayed, and and like it's a it's a shot that holds a little longer than you would expect with like kind of silence. Yeah, yeah. Until he figures out, and then this he, is it. This right. is it. Yeah. It's such a great scene. Oh, both God. both of these scenes, because then there's yeah. the later one where Wallace pulls the same trick. Backwards, like yes. where Wallace holds all the power in both scenes. Yes, like even as everyone's arguing, basically once Mike weighs right. in, mm-hmm. the die is cast. Uh, I love Plummer. Like Plummer has such a he, he. This guy has such a sense of like dramatics, even in a boardroom. He's a showman. Scene. He's exactly. the greatest. Show. Yeah. He knows exactly when to be like. Yeah. He's like Simon Cowell. Like I'm not going <laughs> right. to not support Lowell right. on this right. one. Right. The, the other, like, but he does uh, it kind of casually. Victory. It's like because in the. In the later scene, as you're saying, like uh, Philip Baker, the, Philip Baker Hall, uh, Don, Don here, great. We Philip love Philip Baker, Baker Hall. Yeah. My God, uh, basically is, says to Mike Wallace, they, ex, you know, explain it to him, mm-hmm. and yeah, Wallace, yeah. Wallace just goes, "We blew it," or <laughs> however he says, yeah. he says yeah, "We yeah, blew it." I believe. It, I think yeah. it's "We yeah. blew it." We blew it, and Don. it's kind of just he just says he's like, "We blew it, Don." Yeah, like it's just matter of fact, right? And it's so great. It's amazing, oh, right? And then, and then it's that great line where the the fifteen minutes of fame thing, right? Right. When Phil Baker Hall like is just no, like, okay, I'm blocking out Pacino, that's fame. and he's right. like, look, Mike, listen, these things blow over. Yeah, right, right, right. Fifteen minutes is done. Right. Yeah. That's that. These things um, don't blow over. Right. The other Pacino scene I love because so and then much Wallace the movie, gets the line wrong too, which annoys me. There yes. Because no, it's fame that has a half life of fifteen minutes. Like, no, that's not the line either. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's everyone will be, be in the future. Everyone will be famous minutes. for fifteen minutes. Right. It's not we'll have a half life. Yeah. Yes. Right. That would be um, seven and a half minutes. The yeah. other Pacino scene I love because so much of this character is about like just like his line of integrity that he's got such a clear moral compass about like this is how journalism works. This is how you take care of your sources, you know, that like this thing kind of breaks him because this is the first time he feels like he's he hasn't done right by a source. Right. Someone who put their faith into right him. because the whole movie when he's saying things like I don't burn people like right. he's speaking from a position of why would I total do authority right. like right. he totally right. believes in himself. Right. I have a code I've and code I'm backed conduct. up by CBS and you won't you know we we will protect you on this right. right so he's talking so much about what he stands for and who he is as a person making this a personal relationship like they do sort of become weird friends over the course of the movie because they're so invested together in this like this crusade you know yeah. Right. Uh, that they sort of become like, like uh, I don't know, like brothers in arms right. uh, in this uh, this shared battle. Uh, but that early scene where uh, the uh, crow tries to uh, uh, psychoanalyze his relationship with his father, and Fatino's just like, "We don't talk about that. What's your deal with you?" <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's good. Yeah. Um, you have to pay your money now. No, what's going on? What's your father? Tell <laughs> us something. 
Did I mention the, all the opera singing? A lot of opera you singing. That crazy that. scene where the wallpaper behind him kind of melts. That's the right. scene that I didn't. As a kid, I was like, this must be like what art is. <laughs> yeah. That, that's... Like during this fairly like right. realistic biopic, right. then yeah. this happens. Yeah. yeah. That scene didn't fully work. Rewatching it now, I'm kind of like, weird that Michael Mann did this. Yeah. Weird moment. Very out yeah. of character. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I kind of like it. I, I don't mind it. It's just I, odd. I didn't mind it because what happened was I, I rewatched this movie a week or so ago. Um, uh, right before Griffin rescheduled. Yeah, I rescheduled. I had a haircut. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because behind the scenes for the people I wasn't at gonna, home. I wasn't going to even say that you rescheduled right. because and of a haircut. And I was going to say it, and I said it uh, yeah. Un- yeah. until you know less than twenty four hours before we were supposed to tape. Right, Griffin. which you said you'll give us a wave this time, but next time next cancellation time I, fee. I, I get a full cancellation, yeah. which yeah. I think should be the yeah. Griffin. That should be it. Yeah. Uh, okay. So I anyway, so hundred bucks on the table. Uh, so that scene didn't bother me. <laughs> it's laughing. That scene didn't bother me when I rewatched it. When I watched it, really for the first time since ninety nine. Yeah, sure, 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 sure. I rewatched it again last oh, night. Oh wow! Boy. And I, I tried to I tried to prepare. Well, honestly, I was just going to kind of skim through it, and I got sucked it's back it's in. A and I ended up just movie. I was going to maybe watch just watch the first half. That was, has happened was, to me after with this Game podcast. of Thrones. This was like at eleven thirty yeah. at night. And the next thing I knew, it's like one fifteen. I'm like, well, it's only a half hour left. I'm right. I can't yeah. stop watching this now. But it bothered me then. No, it's a cow. No. Film-loving cow? Oh, my God, David. <laughs> uh-huh. It's our new favorite character. Okay. The cineast cow. <laughs> Let's wow. listen closely. Okay. It's got a little cappuccino. Mm-hmm. It's got a tote bag from the IFC Center. Of course. It's got one of those uh, director tees. Yeah, the <laughs> metal <laughs> right. Uh-huh. And what's it saying? It's got the palma, but it looks like Black Flag or whatever. Right, right, exactly. You know. Moby. <laughs> Moby. Well, unsurprisingly, it sounds like this cow is a subscriber to Mubi.com. This makes perfect sense. Curated streaming service that shows exceptional films from around the globe. I mean, this is a cow that would want a service that premieres a new film every day, whether it's a timeless classic, a cult favorite, or an acclaimed masterpiece. This cow is going to get a movie it's been dying to see, or one it's never even heard of before, and there are always 30 different films to discover. And no. we've, we've talked about it, you know, every day. Movie goes, movie comes. Much like life. Much like life. And There's always is, something new. There's always something gone. This is an existential cow. <laughs> Clearly. Clearly. Well, let me tell the cow about some of the movies that are on movie right now okay. to check out. Oh, we've got Citizen Four. Laura Poitras's oh. uh, documentary about Edward Snowden. Does it play differently five years on? I would bet so. I think so. Yes. I think Glenn Greenwald comes off weird in <laughs> yes. that movie. Uh, did you like Nocturama? I've never seen Nocturama. It's pretty good. Well, how about Bertram Bonello's film On War? If you want more Bonello in your life. Provocative title. Very provocative director. Uh, what else have we got going on here? Uh, oh, yeah. They had the Eugene Green movies. Eugene, whatever. Eugene Green. <laughs> I'm trying to say it French, but why bother? Eugene okay. Green. Which are those crazy movies where the, every piece of dialogue is delivered directly to the camera. Yeah, that's my kind of movie. I don't want I, I like people making eye contact with me. <laughs> None of this talk. side on business. Yeah, None of the side eye. Well. And uh today they added Benny Chance the White Storm, three of Hong Kong's biggest stars in a sprawling crime story. They got all kinds of exciting stuff like this stuff you've never heard of, stuff from filmmakers like that, you know, you never got to fill in like part of their filmography. <laughs> energy in this ad read is incredible. I'm so happy this cow, the cineast cow walked through the door because it's really changing. It's like directly affecting the rest of the ad read, you know? Wait, wait, does the cow have anything to say? <laughs> oh, wait. Oh, some milk. He's giving it to you, Griffin. Oh, a little bit of uh, milk. Movie milk? Yeah. Let me look in here in the truck. Oh my god, this isn't milk. It's hot takes. Oh boy. The cineast cow. <laughs> When you milk it, what comes out of the udder? Hot take. Our hot takes. You can try movie free for 30 <laughs> days at movie.com slash check. That's M-U-B-I dot com slash check. You get a whole month of great cinema for free. Movie.com slash check. Once you sign up, you're going to want to stick with it. It is uh, it is a very rewarding service. Glass full of hot takes. <laughs> we could uh, we could pasteurize it and then you could spread the, the takes on Bread. Hey, no rush. I think the Sinias cow is going to be coming back very often. Good. So let's save it for next time. What the movie shows at the end is like for Bergman, ultimately, this guy was a source. Yeah. Right. And he's already on to, he's already 
breaking the Unabomber story yeah. apparently the very next day. Hell yeah. Right. Um, I mean, that's yeah. insane. Yeah. Just yeah. a great week for him. <laughs> yeah. I mean, right. a great he run. was having the best week ever. Yeah, right? no, he really yeah. was. Yeah. Uh, so like quitting CBS or whatever. And yeah. So if for him, Perfect it's always week. like he's on to the next. Yes. It's just, you think throughout this movie that these guys are developing a friendship. And then I think at the end, you realize that, and not necessarily this makes Bergman a bad guy, but that at the end, it was really, he was a source, not a friend. You know what I wanted? I just realized exactly what I wanted. What I want is the fucking Richard Parker Life of Pi scene. Like, I don't want a closing scene where they're on the phone. They're like, I love you, man. I'm like, I know. I love you, too. I you're want the scene. Jeffrey. I want the scene you got that's a great like, ass. <laughs> like Crow saying, like, we did it. And Pacino going like, yeah, I'm sorry. I got to get back into the edit. Right, you right, know, right. I want right, the yeah, final yeah, yeah. wrap up scene that's yeah. underlining the fact that this isn't a friendship. Right. I'm right. talking to this would have been great Unabomber if, guy. If Wigan yeah. had called and Debbie Mazur, who who's, picks up, who's right. so picks great. up, and then Pacino's like, tell him I'll call him back. I like, I like, I want like, one note good. like that. Yeah. Because it feels like that scene with the hotel room changing. Do you think is, it's too late? Maybe. I mean, he could go back. He so goes back. I mean, you don't need I to mean, put any makeup on Crow now. Yeah. <laughs> Just turn the camera on. Yeah. They, and says, Pacino, they can do some Irishman de aging, yes, right? Yes. <laughs> Um, uh, it does feel like uh, that scene with the hotel room transforming because that character is at such a rock bottom where you're mm, so worried right. and he's so worried that he's going to commit suicide. Right. Like I was watching the movie going like, Wh- fuck, am I going to Wikipedia just to feel the relief of knowing that he isn't dead today right, or am sure. I going to stick with the movie? Because right, sure. I got so nervous. I was like, I'd kind of like to just know yeah, that he Please don't tell it. me this ends like on truly tragic. Right. Right. Well, according right. to yeah. Wigan, that never, like he never... The really? wallpaper never he, changed. The wallpaper. No, he didn't. Actually, I have, I have not seen him deny that. Okay, right. Yeah. Right, right. Uh, but he d- does say that the movie took, like, yeah. He, he never was, hit, yeah, like, that much of a He was never for sure. near suicide or anything. And that's more, anything. Pacino just is afraid Pacino's that worried. it's going to happen. No, hurt. absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Um, but the fact that the hotel room changes into just the daughters around him makes it, like, this whole movie is just about him trying to get his daughter's respect. And we also know that he has a previous daughter from a previous marriage who he's been shitty to. Yep. Yeah. You know, a sick ex-wife. I agree. A right. It's the repair. one thing that maybe feels The daughter neat. thing feels a little neat and binary. Yeah. Yeah. When the room starts transforming, I was like so thrilled because I was like, this is such a cool, like expressive visual thing to just show his like world sort of like right. morphing right. around. I thought it was going to turn out he was in a video game. Like, the, like, yeah, well, sure. Right. Right. Sure. Like yeah. a movie that won't be named. No. Uh, Wreck-It Ralph. Um, but the moment when it then turns into the very clean, neat backyard, then I was like, well, now this is less interesting. It's a little less Like, I thought it was cool that it's just, like, the way this guy feels right now is just, like, the walls are, like, morphing around. Right. I don't need them to settle into a different location. Yeah. 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 We were also saying this was the last year where you could have this sort of wailing in a soundtrack right. and not have it be a historical epic or a war film. Exactly. Right. This is the last time you could have wailing in an office or a hotel room. <laughs> <laughs> might have been the first time <laughs> this might be the only time but there was also at one point in the score and I th- it's it's towards the end of the movie because it's in like sort of a tense mm-hmm. area all of a sudden as part of the score there's a heavy saxophone yes and i was sitting there going big oh, jazz sax. this is a 90s movie yeah. oh yeah big jazz was, sax. man where did that saxophone that's michael come mann from? yes wow i On know set yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Live. Yeah, if he's feeling a scene, he whips yeah. out the sack. It has sack. to be the guy from uh, 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 the vampire movie, Lost Boy. Oh yes, oh, it, has sure. to, I, it has to be that guy. And I think David's right because I remember reading an interview with the sound guy where he was like, "I was furious. Like he ruined a bunch of good takes. <laughs> he just whipped out the sax and started wailing." <laughs> Um, no, but but that whole extent sequence where Pacino's on his forced vacation, like on the beach, and he's still miserable. Right. And when he's like at night in the dark, standing in the middle of the ocean, mm-hmm. like in his pants on the cell phone, screaming to Roger Bart. <sighs> Poor Roger Bart. Yeah. He uh, he's getting it from both sides in that scene. Yeah. Because uh, <laughs> Wagon's not nice to him either. But but well, Mike, when he his look when Wagon slept when Wagon grabs yes. the phone. And then slams the door, and like he grabs the phone, and he goes, yeah. he, he kind of like yeah. jerks back. I just realized nobody can see this. <laughs> he's, and then, for the and listener, then Crow Andy's slams back. the door in his yes. face, and he jerks back again. And it's yeah, like, oh good, great and little acting rattling. Job there. He's yeah. lucky the crow didn't yeah. throw the phone in his face. <laughs> <Yeah>. Oh hello, hey, what is it? Pop out, ding 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 ding. Joke bell. Um, now can we please now talk about the scene where Mike Wallace annihilates everyone around? Yes. 
<laughs> because he only says one line in a in a That's the scene interview. I wanted to talk about. That's just that's Gina Gershon's favorite right. scene. And I, I love him earlier. when when he calls. Uh, that's the scene where I literally leaned forward and then when the scene was over said, wow, aloud. <laughs> I was so happy. But when he calls Lowell and is like, look, I know you're upset about, uh, you know, the alternate cut, but I think you're going to be pretty happy when yeah, you see what really, I Yeah, he's really like, this is going to blow yeah, your mind. I heart. really put my foot down. And <laughs> yeah. Lowell's like, go fuck yourself. And he's like, how dare you? Wait until you say, no, no, you know, you were right. <laughs> <laughs> you ant. Yeah, uh, <laughs> you cut the guts out of what I said. Yeah, God, it's so scary. Yeah. What's his answer? He says yes. Uh, wh- who they says? Go, Do you think yeah, CBS yeah, yeah. interfered? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Why the hell's the rest? Yeah. Let's see. Um, a time you corporate lackey. Yeah. <laughs> Tobolowski saying, you know, time constraints. Uh, who told your incompetent little fingers you had the requisite skills to edit me? <laughs> He's so good. Fifty years. <laughs> Yes, yes. Yeah. But that's the scene. fucking years. That's the scene where I felt like, again, the sort of the treatment of Gina Gerson's character, the female character. Mm-hmm. Sure, she gets a lot of it. I mean, Tobolowski was, but. Well, he the, gets run over immediately. He just gets, that's the thing. <laughs> right. that's he's just, he's right. like ineffectual. Right. Yeah. And he's, he's just sort just of treated dismissed. as like an embodiment of Satan. Well, sure. And, yeah. and he's like, you know, because she calls him Mike. Yeah. Which he gave him Mike. I'm Mr. Wallace. Mr. Wallace. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the whole thing was like, it was a. I don't know. Maybe I'm just overly sensitive I, to it, but I it was felt the same way. It was a little icky. And also I watching thought. all these Michael Mann a, movies, it's just it's it, enough of it, a well, recurring event. Yeah, it's exactly. fair. It yeah. becomes so yeah. unavoidable. Yeah. I mean, absolutely, because yes. it started Mike making me Wallace. think of Pete and other and, and stuff. his male characters are so fucking nuanced. They're like and eight conflicted. dimensional. Yeah, <laughs> right. right. Yeah. No, but, but but this movie is not. They're eight being dimensional, kind. but they do all have the same code. They do. Yes. Well, man has to have a code. Yeah. But Mike Wallace is not a. He's the not quite villain, but he is certainly an unsympathetic character in this movie. Oh, sure. He's no just this is, kind right. of insane right. force of nature. Yeah. Right. Uh, but but then, yes, the tides turn because you of- You corporate uh, lackey. Yeah. Imagine if Christopher Plummer called me a corporate lackey, I would burst into tears. I would. Yeah. yeah. I would cry. I would just think it sounded cool. I, I would like, think it was cool. Like, I would also I, smile. Yeah. Um. What if I had to talk about Funko to Chris <laughs> as Mike Wallace? So Christopher Plummer, ha- Chris Plummer might have a Funko at this point. I'm going to look it up. Um, uh, Mike Wallace. I sit wherever I damn please. Yeah, that's about it. What does this have to do with the price of tea in China? I could just listen to Al Pacino read dialogue like that all day. I mean, the, the dialogue is just like so fucking musical without being like overly sort of written. Right. You know? Right. He finds that way to just like boil it down to like the cleanest, most succinct it, thing that still has a good rhythm to it. Yeah, yeah. It's like a much less theatrical mammoth. Yes. Yeah. It's yes. basically what right. it is. It's yes. mammoth without you feeling just it feeling so heightened that you're yeah. like, okay, I, this is a mammoth. Thing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Lindsey Krauss, too. Yeah. yeah. What are you looking up? Funko Miami Vice is the closest <laughs> I think we've gotten to so the like Michael a Funko Man. Man. But they're not even. No, why would they be? No, but see, look, they're not the standard. They look kind of good. All right. Whoa. Yeah. So I need to tell my DGA story. Please. Oh, go, go ahead. ahead. Yeah. So back when this movie came out, I was at the time I was the I think it was the deputy communications director for the Directors Guild. Mm-hmm. Um, and as part of that, I ran. I, I, I was in charge of like the red carpet, pr- the press line at the DGA Awards. Mm-hmm. And then during the show, I was back in the press room and I, where the winners would come back and, you know, talk to the press, whatever. And every um, nominee at the DGA Awards gets a freaking trophy. So that's, we had, everyone's a winner. We had just started uh, either that, I don't know if that was the first year, but it was right around that time they started this thing where they would give. Well, I guess maybe they always gave the trophy. Like the big plate. Yeah, what, we, what we started yeah. doing was having uh, an actor from the movies uh-huh. present because mm-hmm. that gave us star power. Yes. So that year we were able to get. Uh, they present each nominee. Each feature film right. nominee yes. throughout the night. We get presented with this plate and it would be presented by one of the actors from their movie, hopefully. Mm-hmm. So Russell Crowe agreed to do it for Michael Mann for I- The Insider. So I'm, you know, the show's going on and it's, it's a Hollywood award show. So it's a good eight, nine hours long. And Very long. A tight nine. Yeah. It's a I tight remember nine. the DJ yeah. awards as an Oscar watcher. You'd be like, they'd be like, the DJ awards are starting. And I'd be like, great. Yeah. I'll wake up tomorrow and find no, out. No, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Unless you want to find out who the uh, best achievement for directing in a children's program. Is. <laughs> right. You can get that in like 10 minutes. Right. That happens during that's, our dirt. That's fairly early. Yeah. 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 Right. yeah. At one point we're back there and, and all of a sudden this 
guy comes back and it's Russell Crowe. And he, he's like, phone in hand. I want a beer. No, he's like, I, I really just, like, he couldn't, he just, he wanted a beer. Uh huh. And, you know, at these, a lot of these, at these dinners, you're at a table and it's, uh, it's just wine, basically. And he wanted a beer. Sure. He's an Aussie. So, uh, one of the security people we work with was like, I'll, I'll get you a beer. And he goes and he comes back five minutes later and he hands Russell Crowe a beer. And Russell Crowe gives him a hundred dollar bill. Wow. And that's my story. That's a pretty good story. What kind of beer was it? Was it, it was like Austin's? an Amstel Light? No, because it was like a, it was the Beverly Hilton or whatever. Do you think like that Russell Crowe thinks beer costs a hundred dollars? <laughs> it's entirely. He may have thought they were America's pants a weird place. or something. Yeah, right. I don't know. No, it's nice. But it was very nice. That's of very him. nice. And yeah. he was, you know, despite his reputation, which I'm sure is completely deserved. Even back then, it was like this guy's like yeah. he's moody. Yeah, but he also but, has that rep of being kind of like a, a massive lad, like a good, exactly, you know, a good yes. sort of. Yeah. You know, he you, you could have, like, a bunch of pints with him, and he'd be, like, telling you stories. I think he just has that rep of, like, he kind of runs hot. Right. Uh, ben is looking at me confused, what? and he mouthed massive the word massive lad? lad. A massive lad. What is that? Yeah. Yeah. What language are you speaking? What are you talking about? Don't If you're doing the Look, bit, I'm mad at you. Not doing the bit. Okay. okay. For those massive of us, lad. For those of us who grew up here, David, what yeah. are you talking about? Can you convert well, like, a babble fish A me, lad please. is like is a- he like a bro? Is yeah, like a bro. Yeah. Oh, you know okay. what I mean? Like okay. Kind of like something you'd be like, oh, a pair of lads here. You know, like it's something you would just say if you were drinking, and you would do this, which is crazy. David is hitting me in the you? What would you do? You, know, you kind of pat the guy on the shoulder. Mm. English people can only like emotionally interact when they're drunk or drinking, yes. and so like that's the that's when it starts. You know what I mean? Like two men can now talk about things. Uh, what I what I heard about Russell Crowe, yeah, uh, uh, from people who have worked with him recently. Okay, uh, crew members, not like you know other actors. Like uh, it extends even to like PAs and such. Mm. Uh, that he. Um, uh, will uh, it, he has his bars? He has his restaurants. He likes wherever he films. He finds the place, uh -huh. and he will just sort of uh, rent out uh, if they have a basement, if they have a top floor, if there's any sort of separate area that he can take, and anyone from uh, the cast or crew uh, who wants to come with him. And drinks are just on him all night. Right. That he just wants to uh, drink uh, six <laughs> hours a night. Uh, he's a big social drinker. Uh -huh. Sure. He likes going out. Right. I'm he's a very, massive lad. He's very generous. <laughs> David, I'm uh, a massive in lad. In extending sure that to anyone. Sure. Uh, sure. But, but I, th I think he is a very, uh, you know. You know what that is? That's a great way of, like, you know, you say, well, I'm not an alcoholic. I don't drink alone. I never drink alone. I never drink alone. Right. So what you do is you buy out the bar every night. Right. And invite everyone there That's and okay. pay for their drinks. I think he wants to just still be a guy who can, like, go into a pub and just, like, spend the night there and have a great conversation. But now he's too famous to do that in an environment he doesn't control. Right. So he essentially goes, like, can I rent out a section of your pub right. and create my own guest list? Yeah. And the guest list is people who have gotten desensitized to Russell Crowe right. and have worked with him <laughs> enough that they're like, yeah, I can drink with you. It's fine. I would love to drink with Russell Crowe. He loves maps, which I also love. Do you know that he loves, he loves maps? maps? Oh, he man. talks about maps a lot. Doesn't I got to find you the, the legendary There's Russell the... Crowe maps tweet. Yeah. His Twitter is A+. Plus, if well, you ever he had want. one of the great uh, uh, divorces of all time where he uh, sold off a bunch of his uh, uh, life uh, mementos and curios. Uh, to uh, pay off his uh, <laughs> his alimony. Yeah. And uh, he, he sold it all at like Christie's or one of the yeah. Sotheby's, one of the auction houses. Here's one of them that I just love. <laughs> this is what I love maps. <laughs> this is my favorite maps, one. Maps. I love them. Love reading them. Love planning adventures. Love seeing how things relate topographically. <laughs> and there's some, I'm going to find it. There's some photos of him like at some kind of map museum <laughs> where he's like so into it. That could not be more of a drill treat. Tweet if he tries. Oh, I know, right? So Love to relate to them topographically. Uh, David, can you look up a uh, Russell Crowe art of divorce? Okay. This was he sold. He had his big auction. Oh, I remember this. Yes, because like uh, uh, he got divorced very recently. A lot of people were like vying for like they they sold the um. The uh, the jock strap from uh, Cinderella Man. Right, they uh, got like, these actors, like gladiator props and stuff. Right? Like De Niro's yeah. a guy who famously, if he does a movie, any single object he touches contractually, he gets to own. Uh -huh. De Niro has archives, uh -huh. and he's like, if I use a prop in a scene, if it touches my hands, it's it's mine. Really? Yeah. And someday he'll donate it all. It'll be the De Niro archives, and it's everything he's ever used. Russell Crowe, I think, is not that controlling. I think more actors should be like that. Yeah. But they get like rules. a library when they it, die, yeah. like right. a president. Yeah. Right. <laughs> 
like I have a friend who was very proud that he got a De Niro prop that he pulled here one are, here are some it. of the props but that image is what I want to show you this one this the middle image of him toasting the glass uh-huh. that was the cover of the auction catalog beautiful and nice. auction catalogs are usually very austere of course, and they just yeah. show the items yes. and it was him in a tuxedo yeah, uh, <laughs> toasting a glass <laughs> And it said, Russell Crowe, The Art of Divorce. He made $3.7 <laughs> million. Dollars. Yes. Wow. It's pretty good. The Art of Divorce. But yeah, he kept all his props and he sold them off. Like here, you could buy the purple suit from Virtuosity. Yeah. Oh my God. He oh, kept yeah. like everything. You could buy a, a hockey jersey from Mystery Alaska. Can you see if there's anything from Insider? <laughs> what would the glasses. There be? The a glasses. button yeah. down? The glasses. Uh, the, bullet. the bullet. The bullet. He touched the bullet. Yeah. Uh, let's, let's find out. By the way, I think he may have me blocked on Twitter. Really? Russell Crowe? Yeah. yeah. Did you I piss think. him off? Well, I tweeted uh, after I saw Les Mis. <laughs> I, I not a great movie. I tweeted something. Not a great and I didn't add him because I'm not, no, you're not a jerk. Not yeah. a jerk. But I tweeted something like, uh, I guess Les Miserables is a reference to the people who just listened to Russell Crowe sing for two uh-huh. hours or Fair something job. like that. Fair I mean, right. And after he had to, he had to pull himself off the wall that you had nailed him to. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> And I, I, if I remember correctly, I think he blocked me after that. Wow! I tried to look at a tweet of his. And he I loves maps. Couldn't. It's too bad you couldn't. You could. I heard. know. I could have bonded with him over maps. There is one item related to the insider okay. in this lot. Here we go. Item number nine: two Louisville Slugger baseball bats given to Russell Crowe during the production of the film The Insider, signed by Al Pacino. <laughs> <laughs> Don't understand it. Don't know why he got a baseball bat. Don't know why Pacino signed it. Signed both well, of them. It was Kentucky. That's true. That's true. Film set in Kentucky. Yeah. Maybe they like went to visit like the Louisville Slugger factory. Yeah. I Sometimes bet, I if you're a big famo, they're like, true. please come, yeah. you know, have a free tour. You say a big famo? A big famo. Yeah. You know, the big famo. <laughs> this was yeah, sold yeah. for $5,124. As we could have pulled together our been. money. We could have got that. Uh, two bats, two friends. Let's see if any other art of divorces are... St- I think it's all gone. Yeah, no, this is a couple years ago. Yeah, it's all over. Um, this is what I wanted to say, the couple of things I found. Uh, one, uh, do you know that when they were filming the film, uh, or when they were you know, in pre-production and uh, production, uh, several years after the real events, uh, Russell Crowe could still not meet Wygand because of his confidentiality agreements. Wow. He was really? not allowed to help them at all. Uh, that is fascinating so it was wow. all sort of the public record stuff roth met him just to get a sense of him as a person but couldn't ask him any questions about the case said he found him unlikable all russell crowe had to go off of was the raw footage from the 60 minutes wow. interview his entire performance was that's just that. nuts right that is nuts uh that's crazy it's crazy that the confidential uh, confidentiality agreements extended that far and that long huh. um the other Cigarette thing, companies i think those guys might not be on the level they might I, be kind of I, I mean sure it's in 20, you know, I guess it's easy to say that now. Right. I guess, right. I'm I mean, look, I, I'm not saying it's easy. It's, it's still, I'm just saying I don't think you're very brave in saying that. I think I'm I think really brave. brave. I think I, I should be on 60 Minutes. I, I think Lowell Bergman should be uh, <laughs> pumping me up right now. You're a hero. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, okay. The end of the movie is that Bergman, uh, you know, there, there's this sort of smear campaign that kind of gets discarded. Mm. Like the Wall Street Journal digs into it and they're like, eh, this doesn't seem like much. Yeah. Uh, Bergman leaks the tape to the Times. Mm-hmm. Uh, I love that scene where he calls the reporter. It's Pete Hamill, like, by the way. I know. Played by Pete. I mean, it was that's the real Pete Hamill. Hamill. And yeah. I believe Jack Palladino, who's an actual, yes. pup, like, plays himself as well. Yep. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's such a good scene uh, where yeah. he's, like, trying to wrangle Pete Hamill. It's like, this will be on page one, right? And Pete Hamill's yeah. like, do you think I'm in the page one <laughs> meeting? Yeah. Right. Like, I don't yeah. fucking yeah. know. <laughs> yeah. I'll talk to someone. <laughs> um, which would never be in a normal movie. Like yeah. a normal movie, he'd be like, it's got to be page one. And right. be, of course, of course, it's going to be on page one. the fold. Right. Yeah. I have page one right here. Let me just. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, or and he just go, hold page one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Pacino's on the line. <laughs> David Mazar is like, holding. Um, and then that's it. I mean, then there's the scene where right. Wallace flips. Yeah. Right? That's it. Yeah. That's the dam that breaks. And then Bergman quits. And then Bergman quits. He quits. I, I think the ending, I mean, the, the be a slow motion. Well, I was going to say, it's the Matrix. He turns into Neo. Co- it does feel he like Neo turning into Neo. The, crowd, right? the music is going. It's like the the here. There's a dance yeah. beat going and the bass line is, pop, is popping. It's uh, it's insane. So you yeah. want to hear this uh, in, insane uh, series of quotes from the Wikipedia page. Uh, the film was considered to be a commercial disappointment, right? Uh, no kidding. Uh, uh, made $60 million worldwide, lower than its $90 million budget. 
Uh, Disney executives, once again, Disney, when Disney still made movies for grownups before they decided they didn't want to make movies for grownups and then decided to buy an entire other studio just so they could make movies for grownups again. Um, Disney executives had hoped that man's film would have the same commercial and critical success as all the president's men. Okay. They greenlit this thinking it was going to be a blockbuster because all the president's men was a big hit. 20 In plus 19th. years also, earlier. All the President's Men was about Richard Nixon's yeah. impeachment, a right. fairly big story. This is about a segment on 60 Minutes. <laughs> like a big deal. Yeah. Ha- however, The Insider had limited appeal to younger moviegoers. <laughs> no, that can't be true. Take that back. Diane Venora's in this. They, they, you know, <laughs> she, was, she, she won a Kids' Choice Award that year, didn't she? Studio executives reportedly said the prime audience was over the age of 40 and the subject matter was, quote, not notably dramatic. Then Disney chairman Joe Rolfe said, it's like walking up a hill with a refrigerator on your back. The fact of the matter is we're really proud we did this movie. People say it's the best movie they've seen this year. They say, why don't we make movies like this? Everyone's really proud of this movie, but it's one of those rare times when adults loved a movie, yet they couldn't convince their friends to go see it any more than we could convince people in marketing the film. What they should have done is they should have, the trailer should have just been the opening scene with Pacino with the blindfolds and in the Middle East and all that. And then cut to the very end of the movie with Pacino in slow motion right. turning up his collar of his trench coat and yes. marketed it to the teens. Yes. Yeah, that's what the recruit turned it out. Uh, right. Cool, yeah. Cool right, Pacino right. who fucks. Right. Um, yeah. So let's go over the box office. I know. I'm guy. really annoyed because I did that thing where, you know, box office mojo will take you to the second weekend for some reason. Ugh. And on the second, on this movie's second weekend, Pokemon, the first movie, debuted in theaters. And then it adjusted $55 million, which wow. is crazy. But that is not what we're going to talk Did about. Did this movie win any Oscars? Did no, it was nominated no. for seven. Right. Picture, uh, director, screenplay, actor. Sure. Uh, cinematography? cinematography. Cinematography. Editing. editing sound mixing? Sound. Yes, which okay. is sound It was mixing. one. Yeah. Uh, it didn't win any Golden Globes either. Uh, it got nominated for one BAFTA for acting and one Screen Actors Guild Award for acting. Plummer was snubbed across the oh, board. Crazy. Crazy. Really weird. Yeah. Uh, it did, however, sweep the Los Angeles film critics. It got picture, actor, supporting actor, cinematography. Wow. And like did well in general at like critics awards. Mm-hmm. It, National Society gave it actor and supporting actor. You know, like. But I think this movie's. It was uh, well liked by critics. And, and its reputation at the time was more. This is the real serious, undeniable launch of Russell Crowe. It felt That's like, for sure. Right. Yeah. Yes. That, that was now Russell Crowe's proven himself, and now he's going to become a big movie star. And then the next couple of years. He does. It's just kind of funny because I feel like, yeah, it was a flop, but it's such an oscar movie on paper. Yeah. yeah. But it's not really. Right. You know what I mean? A director who otherwise is not very successful with the Oscars. And this is his one real hit with the Oscars. Right. That's it. Ali, like, gets a couple nominations. And, I mean, it was no American Beauty. Oh, my God. 1999. That movie. I know. All right. November 5th, 1999. Number one at the box office. The Insider's opening number four. Okay. With six million dollars, not good. Oof. No good. How many it's, screens? Uh, eighteen hundred. Bad. Tops out at twenty nine. Yeah, about a third of its budget. Really? Wow. Not good. And but internationally, it made. Oh, I'm seeing here. No, no, thirty one million. Yeah. Okay, so okay. sixty total. Okay. Number one, uh, it's a serial killer movie. Number one's a, se- November. It's a new movie. November ninety nine. Ninety domestic disturbance. No. Oh no, that's two thousand one. Yeah. 99. 99. It's a serial killer movie. Is it a horror film? Is it like a more adult thriller? I would call it like an adult thriller. Ben, you it's look a, like you got a clue. Like a, 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 an iconic star of the 90s and an up and coming star. It's not. Uh, what's the one with that? Uh, was it McG? It's not a McG. Okay. What's the I, bad movie? It's from a somewhat it, serious director. Uh, Charlie's Angels Word is in the title, and I love. There's a word you love in yeah, the title? Yeah, this is going to be one of those classic confusing Ben uh, clues. Dirty? <laughs> nope. No. Jewel? No. Jewel. Vape? No. <laughs> no, come on. This is a 90s movie. It's a 90s. It's 1999. It's two stars. One of them is emerging. The other one is, is legendary. Top of the heap. Yeah. Serial killer. Which one plays the serial killer? Neither of them. They're on the case. Oh. oh. It's not a uh, bone collector. It is bone oh, collector. Oh, jeez. And that's come up before. And it, it has. had struggled to get It's wow. not one that you no. remember off the no. top of the deck. Philip Noyce. Philip Noyce film. Collected Denzel those Washington. Bones. Love bones. Yeah, of course. Angelina that's a word you Jolie, love. Queen Latifah, Michael yeah. Rooker. Mm-hmm. You, you like the word me. collector? <laughs> <laughs> no, I like the word collector. I love Kurt. Uh, I love to curate. Uh, right, but that was like that was her like big movie wow. right before she wins the Oscar. Correct. Right. Correct. Exactly. Right. Number two. 
Okay. Is a horror remake. It's a remake, not a continuation. It's a hard remake. A hard remake. Zemeckis? Not Zemeckis. 99. 99. It's not a good oh, movie. Is it? It's not Gus Van Sant's Psycho, is it? No. Love that movie. That's 98. Hmm. It's wild. wild hmm. A uh, remake from- uh, My favorite thing about Psycho is how Gus Van Sant always gives a different answer as to why he made it. Yes. Like, sometimes he's like, well, I wanted to make sure no one else remade it. Yeah. It's like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Other times he's like, I don't know, I thought it'd be cool to just do a shot for shot remake <laughs> and change three things. Uh, what? Come on. Uh, what uh, era is ensemble. the film it's remaking from? Uh, it's an I ensemble? Can... Yeah, 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 yeah. Is it, uh, it's not The Haunting. Is it the other That's one? That's the other one. Again. It's the Hill House one? Yes. It's called, uh, it's, it's not called The Haunting on Hill House, is it? No. It's called, uh. It's sort of like a dyslexic version of the title. <laughs> house, on, house on a Hill? House on Haunted Hill. House on Haunted Hill, okay. <laughs> we got Jeffrey Rush. Chris Fake Kattan. Oh, I forgot about that Peter movie. Peter wow. Gallagher. Chris Kattan. Howie Larder. Tay Diggs. Chris Kattan. Chris Kattan. Yeah. It's the cl- it's the uh, you know he's like if you you'll get one million dollars if you just stay yeah, one night. No, I right. saw it. Great I, setup. Yeah, right. It's that, a Vincent Price. Movie. That and the haunting had similar setups where both mm-hmm. remakes and yeah. came out within six months of each other. That's yes. why it's right. Zemeckis one. That's right. what I thought. Yes. And they're both fairly bad. Yo, the um, Zemeckis the haunting was horrible. Well, that's not Zemeckis. That's, that's uh, uh, Young uh, uh, Young Debont. Oh, what am I? Th- uh, what oh, lies what lies beneath, beneath is what which I'm is a, which is I like that one. Yeah, that was all right. I that was, but that, that's right. It the was haunting is uh, Neeson, uh, Owen Wilson, Owen Wilson, yeah. Lily Taylor, off, Lily Taylor, Catherine Zeta Jones. Yeah. right. Not good. No. Neither of them good. No. 1999. I just remember 1999. There were only two movies that hit number one at the box office and didn't make a hundred million dollars. Okay. And, and they that's were one of them? The Haunting and uh-huh. Eyes Wide Shut. Mm-hmm. Is a mm-hmm. weird stat. Mm-hmm. Interesting. All right. The th- number three at the box office is a movie that, like, truly beautifully does not exist. <laughs> like, it's like a masterpiece of non-existence. Is it a romantic drama? It's a romantic comedy. comedy? It's a remake, but that's not a helpful clue. It's not a helpful So it's like um, an obtuse remake or the thing it's remaking is It's a remake of something well-known. that's incredibly old that no one remembers. Uh, it's obviously not uh, Mitchell Black. It is not. That's not that's a romantic comedy. Right. And also that's well, <laughs> insanely well, long. Well, when that clip had its day on Twitter, yeah. it was a blast. That, that was, was really so funny. funny. It's always fun to watch a new generation <laughs> oh, yeah. realize that happened in a film. Yes. <laughs> That's the birth of uh, Brad Pitt eating, too. That's yes. when he realized how good he was at eating It was camera. just funny how many people had no idea that movie existed. Yeah. Why would they? I, I don't know. I Why guess... would anyone show that film? No, I know, but, it, <laughs> but yeah. even, it's like, crazy. Paul, like Paul F. Tompkins tweeted, like, I have no idea what this is, and right. I don't want anyone to tell me. But it was, like, surprising people. That's what right. I mean. It Not was, even, like, surprising like 15-year-olds, people. Yeah. but, like, people who yeah. were, yeah. Uh, so it's okay. um it's an old old film. In, whatever, don't worry about the remake part. Okay. It's it's a rom com that with like two stars, I guess, of the moment. Mm-hmm. Um, that's like kind of high concept. Like it has like a sort of weird hook to it. it. Has like a weird hook to it. And did the stars did their careers last, or was this really their one and only moment? Both of their careers, the the, the female lead's career is only going up. Okay. She's on her way to an Oscar. She's, really? She's a star. Her career now is kind of done, but like she definitely, uh, you know, she's got uh, more uh, to go. Leader supporting. The Oscar yeah. was a supporting win. It was a support. But she played many re- lead roles. Is it the, Penelope Cruz? No. No. The no. male lead. No. Who, who, who? It's oh, so no. beautiful how non-existent this film. Yeah. You've never heard of this film. No. no. Uh, the male lead is, an I would call, a 90s star. Who never quite popped, but you know certainly was around, and now he's a TV guy. Now he's hardcore it's a TV. So TV. Is it a Chris O'Donnell movie? Oh, well done. Okay. Wow. Speaking of NCIS, That's, yeah. Oh, I know. LA, it, right? I know yeah. exactly yes, what LA. film this it is. It tr- truly does I, not exist. You telling me to not think about the if remake. I said the director's name, it would I wouldn't be. I'd be like. Bah. Um. Because he doesn't exist. He doesn't appear. You telling me to All right, tell me it's what a it's remake. a remake of. It's a remake of uh, uh, Seven Chances. Correct. Well, the your Buster your boy. Film. Yep. That was the thing that would have made me figure out I know, this that's movie why I was faster. trying to put you off the trail. Well, fuck you. The movie's called The Bachelor. And Correct. it's Chris O'Donnell and Renee Zellweger. Correct. And it was kind of her comeback after Jerry Maguire. She had been like quiet oh, for a couple of years. God. I guess that's true. I'm I remember the local news you guys in are New York nerds. doing uh, a segment. No kidding. Yeah. Remember right. her? The only real big movie she'd been in was uh, One True Thing. Right. Yeah. That was sort of her comeback. And there was a there was like a, a fucking CBS like two 
news story that was like, remember her? And they um, played the Jerry Maguire clip. Can I read you the rest of the cast in The Bachelor? The premise of the movie is he will inherit a million dollars if he gets no, married. One hundred million dollars if he gets married. Inflation. In the next like thirty days or right. something. Um Who is the director? Uh Andy Gary Signor. Oh wow. <laughs> okay. Okay. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> wow. Um here are some I just want to run down this cast because yeah. it's one of those things where it's like it's like a left hook and then a right hook and then like an <laughs> uppercut. Okay. Hal Holbrook, James Cromwell, Artie Lang, oh, Ed Asner, <laughs> Marley Shelton, Peter Ustinov? What? <laughs> what? Brooke Shields? Wow. Sarah Silverman? Oh, man, what a thing. Uh, 9% on Rotten Tomatoes, according to this. Nine? Wow. Nine. More than eight. Yeah. That's probably what they said to the director <laughs> yeah. at the time. Uh, yes, which opened to $7 million. It grossed uh, an insider-esque 21. <laughs> uh, and it's just one of those cl- Chris O'Donnell vehicles, like really. Wow. Yeah, those those don't have a long shelf life. No, they yeah. are fake movies that like Cameron Diaz cuts trailers to in the holiday. I'm looking at the other films that Andy Senor directed. He did Stiff Upper Lips, which was like the parody of British like manners dramas. Do you remember that? No. It was like someone trying to make a Zucker Brothers film about Merchant Ivory movies. Okay, okay. Called Stiff Upper Lips. Sure. And then he also directed uh, Bob the Butler, which is a high-concept family comedy in which Tom Green becomes a butler. <laughs> That's how I'm sold. Stars a bumbling buffoon who, after landing at butling, after working his way through all the other A to B jobs. Okay. Um, Is that the Seinfeld pilot? Yeah. Tom Green, Berkshire, like, Bob, uh, Bob the Butler. Uh, number five at the box office, four is the insider, is um, a, a, a good movie, I think, um, from a director who's still working. Uh, it's like, a, I guess, like a romantic drama, sort of comedy drama that's like kind of the best example of this kind of movie. Uh, aimed at a particular audience. A, a young lot audience? of great actors. Eh, sure. Sort of a coming of age movie, kind of a like... Becoming a grown-up movie. It's like a, a wedding movie. It's in 1999. Is it The Best Man? The Best Man. Directed by? Malcolm D. Lee. Correct. Yeah. Uh, because, like, that... I feel like every, like, awesome young black actor of the late late 90s is in that movie. But right? Perno, Diggs, Terrence Howard. Howard uh, Regina Hall. Regina Hall, Morris Chestnut, Harold Perrineau, uh Who else we got? Uh, Neil Long. Neil Long. Uh, Sanaa Lathan. Yes. Sanaa Lathan. I, I think Sanaa. Sanaa yeah. yeah. Um, great, great, great. When are they going to finish the trilogy? Underrated 99 movies. And yes, of course, it got a sequel many years later. Yeah. Uh, that's it. That's a, yeah, that's that's your box office. Wow. I mean, what else you got? You got Double Jeopardy. Yeah. Uh, which is a huge hit that no one remembers. A, a Tell me how much Double Jeopardy made. 117. 116. How does he do it? He's such a nerd. That's the one with Ashley Judd. Ashley Tommy Judd and Lee Tommy Jones. Lee Jones. Yeah. And who's the guy she's pretending? The the guy who uh, uh, faked his own death. Whatever. Right. Because the premise is she went to jail for killing him, but he actually never died. Yeah, mur- his own death murder isn't always him. a crime, as we all know. Right, right. Um, it is Bruce Greenwood. Oh. Yes. Um, we've also got uh, American Beauty, which I guess won Best Picture. Uh, we uh, got The Sixth Sense. A blockbuster that makes like $170 million domestic. Uh, 130. Really? American Beauty. What did it do worldwide? 356. Oh. That's crazy. Yeah. Why did American Beauty play so well overseas? So well. I mean, it was the movie of our time. I guess so. It's the movie of the moment. I guess everyone knows what a plastic bag is. Spoke the truth. <laughs> uh, Fight Club is up there. Yeah. Music of the Heart. Music Wes of Craven's the heart. Music yeah. of the Heart. That's it. We're done. Wow. Right? Yeah. No, we are. Uh, any final uh, thoughts, Andy? Uh, no. Just thank you guys very much. Oh, oh thank this. you this for paying great, any man. attention to us idiots Please. and like yeah. coming to our show. It was great, right? Uh, yeah, no, we are time. dumb. That is a fact. Uh, <laughs> that is a fact. That's a fact. We're, That's a fact we're dumb. Yeah. We're two dumb boys. We are dumb. dumb we're dumbs. dumb boys, but we're also the two friends. We are the two dumb, dumb friends. I was, by the way, I was this close. Uh, for those of you at, at home, I'm holding my thumb and forefinger very mm-hmm. close together. Right very now. close. Mere inch apart. I'd say even less than I, an inch. I think less than an inch. Less than an inch. I was going to have a three friends t-shirt made up 
Are you wow. kidding me? That does feel like an Andy stunt. And like then a, I a thought good surprise. maybe it was a little too single white female, so I no, decided not to. No. But if you have me back, I, I, will, we would I, have I, will, I will do that. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Um, so, yeah, we'll, we will definitely uh, have you back on for the uh, – who, who's the person we're now joking? Penny Marshall used to be the joke that that was our next miniseries, but now we've started seriously considering But then she kind of slayed. Her. Yeah, yeah, right. Right. She was in the March Madness. We need a new director we're going to constantly claim as the next oh, one. Okay. Uh, I don't know. Malcolm, no, Walt, no. Walt Becker, Walt Becker. Andy Senior, Marshall. Gary Andy Senior, <laughs> the Bachelor himself. Uh, I don't know. We'll have you, we'll have you back on on uh, enter uh, a funny reference of movie okay. and director later. Gaspar <laughs> Noé. I don't know. Yeah, sure. The Gaspar Noé is funny. He's yeah. great. It's very serious. Enter the podcast. Enter the podcast. Whoever directed a Serbian film. Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah, that guy. I love when people keep on asking us if we're ever going to do a, mi- a mini series on someone who directed like two movies or one movie, right? And we're like, or we could just do that. What we wouldn't treat it like a mini series <laughs> necessarily, would just be an episode, really. right? Yeah. Um, this is we're sort of or petering out, yeah, we're petering yeah, out yeah definitely. Yeah. Energy's dipping. Yep, uh, it was a very long episode. <laughs> it was a very long episode. Ben's putting for his. Uh, head on the controls. <laughs> yep. Uh, we're done. Uh, we're done. Thank you all for listening. Sure. Uh, please remember to rate, review, subscribe. Please. Thanks to Andrew Figueroa for our social media. Thanks to Lee Montgomery for our theme song. Joe Bowen and Pat Reynolds for our artwork. Go to... Ben's eyes are closed. He's like dreaming of another place. The hotel room is changing around him. <laughs> he's imagining that he's in Russell Crowe's backyard. <laughs> Go to... Blankies.red.com for some real nerdy shit. Uh, uh, Public for some real nerdy shirts. Patreon for blank check bonus features. Uh, you know, follow Andy Levy on Twitter. Yeah. One of the best. Oh, yeah. TV's Andy Why Levy? Not? TV's yeah. Andy Levy. Right? One of the best in the game. Is it still TV's Andy Levy? It's not. Okay. Wait, did you it change it? Oh, you know what I'm thinking of? It was what? TV's Andy Daly was always his Twitter handle. Oh, that is his Twitter. But and I, you are but TV's Andy Levy. No, but I but you to, are just That Andy was Levy. my nickname for yeah. a long time. Right. Self given, right? Yeah, but now I'm no, I'm now I'm a uh, I'm actually a former battle angel. I changed my Twitter bio. I was a battle angel for a while. Andy Battle Angel. Now yes. I'm a former battle angel. <sighs> God. Um, yeah. We we stand some big guys on this podcast. Yeah, yeah. It says right now you're pal Andy. Yeah, yeah. Former yeah. battle angel. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Here we and go. and let me tell you, folks, that name ain't lying because he's our pal Andy. He's our pal. Aww. Campaigning for the third friend. Yeah, you were, you gave him comedy points all those years ago. I did on air. I did. On, on air on television. It was huge. Yes, that was my uh, yeah. That was fun. That felt like the first moment that we were legitimized. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was it. That was when it was all happening yeah. for us. Our minds were blown. <laughs> um. Uh. Yes. Uh, thank you all for listening. Sure. Uh. Tune in next week for uh Ali. That's right. With um Jamel Bowie. With Jamel Bowie. Yeah. That's Coming right. up next week. Very uh, thoughtful and well done episode by uh, Jamel Bowie and not us. <laughs> You're just going to give him. There's one of four. Like, it's not like we did a good There's job. There's no tour of next week's episode. It's not any of the Jamel people was currently great. in this we were our usual idiot selves. Two right. domos. Yeah. Uh, and, and as always, let me sleep. Let me sleep.